Here's Kim. Hey, Kim. Good morning. Good morning. Here's John. Okay, everyone, if you'll go ahead and rename yourself. Um, if anyone has, if anyone's not sure how to do that, let me know. Yeah. Started. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Southeast Breakout. Um, I'm Donna Winucha. I'm one of the three retail specialists in the Southeast part of Branch One. We have an exciting uh, agenda today. Um, I, I hope you really enjoy it. I we, all, we all think that you will. A few reminders for today. If you're having any issues at all in connecting um, or with the platform itself, please go to the help desk. That's in the top right hand corner of your screen. They have a live help option. They'll be able to walk you through any issues that you're having. And then for today's session, please put any questions that you have in the Zoom app, uh, the, the chat that's associated with Zoom. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will ask for questions during the presenters. We may hold those questions until the end. Um, you can see the biographies for each of the speakers under the speaker tab at the top of your screen. And there will be some reference materials for our speakers that will be available under the document screen as well. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, Liz O'Malley is our director of Branch One within the Division of Retail Food Protection. Um, in Branch One, we have the combined old regions of the Northeast and the Southeast. Uh, Liz uh, went to Hunter College in New York City and has a Bachelor of Science degree uh, from State University of New York at Stony Brook. And we welcome our boss, Liz O'Malley. Liz, take it away. Thank you, Donna. I am, can you see me now? I just wanna make sure. Yes, we can okay. see you and I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my oh, screen? Thank you. I can see it now. Yeah, thank okay. you. So good morning, everyone. And I'm so happy that we're finally here again to uh, have our seminar. It's probably one of the most exciting things I think we do every year. So I hope you're all enjoying it so far, despite a few little glitches we had yesterday. And um, it's okay. We're going to get through this and we're going to get through this well. So as many of you know, I always like to acknowledge some of the exciting changes that have happened since our last seminar. And we had some big ones this year. First, I'd like to welcome both Andre Pierce and Christine Applewhite to our staff within the Office of State Cooperative Programs. As many of you know, Andre comes to the FDA after working 30 years at Wake County, North Carolina. And Christine Applewhite is the newest specialist to our team in Branch One, and she will be working with the specialists you all know so well. So I just want to welcome them both, and I hope you'll join me in doing so. We definitely stole two of the best <laughs> from the field. So thank you for letting us have uh, your peers. We've also had a number of retirements since we last met, and I'd like to just point out a few. Tammy Gordon from South Carolina has retired. Mark Sestek of Alabama Department of Public Health retired recently. Carolyn Bombette and Alman Cuso of Louisiana Department of Health recently retired, and Bill Walls, the FDA standardized officer from Tennessee, will be retiring in December. And I wish you all the best. I'd also like to extend my congratulations to Galen Baxter on his recent promotion to State Environmental Health Director at the Georgia Public, at Georgia Public Health. Congratulations. And thank you to Alabama Department of Public Health and Jefferson County Department of Health for the tremendous job you all did providing food safety and security at the World Games this past summer. We'll hear more about those games later this morning from Kim Livesey, but it was a pleasure working with you all and you did such a fantastic job. And lastly, I would like to mention our colleagues in Puerto Rico who are again dealing with the aftermath of a hurricane. I feel like I say this every year. My thoughts and prayers go out to them and we are here to help them if need be. Next, Donna, please. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize and congratulate all the new FSIOs or Food Safety Inspection Officers since last seminar. 
These individuals were successfully standardized in the interpretation and application of the food code since the last time we met. As Andre said yesterday, your role in national food safety is critically important because you're the key players in multiplying out the knowledge and experience you've gained to others with whom you work. So congratulations to Casey Federovich of Florida DBPR, Carla Crowder of Wake County, North Carolina, and Angie Pinion of North Carolina DHHS. Next, please. I'd also want to congratulate all of you who have made such tremendous progress on meeting one or more of the program standards. There are so many of you involved in the standards, I can't mention everyone's accomplishments. I can see there's a total of 152 enrolled jurisdictions in the Southeast states. Many of you have completed a self-assessment and those listed on the slide did so this past year. Congratulations. But the important thing is not to lose momentum. It's important to keep your self-assessments current, not just so you can apply for funding, but also so you know where your program is, where it's successful and where your gaps are. You know, this is not a race to meet all the standards. It's really just to evaluate yourselves on a regular periodic basis and make improvements and just go forward. You know, I, I think we all talk about meeting and conforming to the standards all the time, and that is important. But I, I think it's really important that we don't lose the momentum, as I mentioned, and do our self-assessments because I do see gaps, you know, and COVID has a real problem, caused a real problem there. But I think it's important that we continue to just move forward and contact your food specialist at any time to, if you need assistance. Next, Donna. Speaking of the standards, I wanted to mention that just last month, FDA released the 2022 version of the standards based on the recommendations from the last CFP. There were changes made to standards two, six, and eight that I think will be of interest to you. FDA also developed an easy to use summary of changes program standards 2022 document. They'll, they can all be found on the updated FDA program standards website and we can put the links in the chat so everyone can easily access them. Next, thank you. 2022 also ushered in year two of the Retail Food Flexible Funding Model. I know that more than 35 of you took advantage and received awards for over 66 different projects to help build your program capacity and infrastructure in year one. That's really amazing. The portal is now open for year two until October 12th. Please try to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. There's about $6 million available going into year two. All you need to do to be eligible is to be enrolled in the standards. Otherwise, the rules are pretty similar to year one, and this same portal is being used, same passwords that you've used in the past. And NEHA or your retail food specialist can be contacted for any questions you might have. And I have the information there on the slide. Next, Donna. Thank you. Also part of the Retail Food Flexible Funding Model, NEHA is conducting a retail food safety regulatory needs assessment to gauge the training needs of the regulatory retail food safety community. The purpose of the needs survey is to identify retail food training need, needs and resource needs across the country. The survey will attempt to determine strengths of the retail food safety community and assess gaps in our education and training needs. The results will be shared widely to bolster educational resources, reduce knowledge gaps in training materials and improve workforce capabilities. Niha, would like to have 10,000 survey respondents. I truly hope you will participate in the survey because it's really set up to help all of us. It should take less than 20 minutes. I think I did it in about 10 and the responses will all be anonymous. The survey can be found on both the Association Collaborative and NEHA's website. The needs assessment is only open to regulatory professionals <clears throat> who work in retail food as part of their job. Professionals who do not perform retail duties or work in industry or from academia will be directed to exit the survey. Next, please. Besides funding, a critical <clears throat> way the specialists, retail food specialists help, partner, help our partners with the program standards is through the SAVA or Self-Assessment Verification Audit Workshops that have been developed and delivered. In 2022, we were fortunate to be able to have delivered three face-to-face -face and two virtual courses nationally. Additionally, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and the North Carolina local health departments partnered with FDA and hosted another workshop in June in Pine Knolls Shores, North Carolina. 
This is the ultimate example of the multiplier effect that we talk about over and over again in FDA. And it, and it helps to build networks, which will help all of us to improve our programs and conform with the standards. I'm excited to announce that we already have planned four more SAVA workshops for FY23. Two will be instructor-led virtual workshops, one in January and one in March. There will also be two in-person workshops, one in association with AFCO's annual education conference and the other in conjunction with NEHA's AEC. We're also finalizing a set of online self-directed modules of the SAVA workshop. This series consists of 10 self-guided courses, which will provide relevant information and instruction for retail program enrollment or advancement in conformance with the standards. All the standard courses are independent self-guided courses. However, the completion of the first introductory module is, is mandatory before you can move on to the other nine. Participants may repeatedly access any or all of the nine courses on demand to, so they can learn about the standards or just refresh their knowledge. I truly encourage you to use this resource. Next, please. So what's going on in 2023? Well, I'm really excited to say that we are going to have CFP in 2023 in Houston, Texas, and our specialists will be available to coordinate calls, to answer questions or help you develop your issues. Um, as always, they're here to assist you in any way possible. And I am so happy to say that we are planning to have our retail food seminars face-to-face -face next year. They, we have not yet determined the locations. We're hoping to have at least three, up to five seminars across the country. And we wanna make sure that we incorporate all your feedback into those so that we make them as, uh, as exciting and, and just informative as possible. Thank you, Donna. I know this year you've all heard us talk a lot about new era of smarter food safety, which is FDA's blueprint for the future. I just want to talk a few minutes about some items that I thought might be of interest to you and could be applied in your futures. Move on, please, Donna. I thought you might be interested in hearing what FDA is doing to ensure the safety of food produced or delivered using new business models and how we acknowledge the need to modernize our food safety approaches. FDA is looking to address the protection of foods from contamination as new business models pop up and change to meet the needs of the modern consumer. The evolution of how food gets from farm to our tables continues with the emergence of e-commerce and new meal delivery models that are popping up every day. And it's causing us to reevaluate and change the way we do business. We need to modernize some of our traditional retail food safety approaches and be open to innovation, change, and applying new strategies that we haven't yet used. Next, please. As I just said, the evolution of how food gets from the farm to our kitchen tables has completely changed with the emergence of e-commerce and new delivery models. These new models include online shopping for meals and groceries, a practice that has surged during the COVID-19 pandemic. But even before the pandemic started, we saw online grocery shopping grow, but the pandemic sped this up precipitously. Research indicates that online grocery spending is expected to grow as much as 20% of the market share of food and beverage sales in the next few years, with an estimated 80% of Americans engaging in online grocery shopping by 2024. I know in my family, we, we order Peapod every week. It's the only way we food shop. And, I, and just four or five years ago, I, I would never have thought that that's the way we were gonna go, but it was just easy. And I think it's the way of the future. It's estimated that online grocery shopping will be a $10 billion annual spend in just 2023. With that in mind, we at FDA are trying to change our food safety paradigm a bit and determine whether or how the existing regulations apply to specific e-commerce activities. We're looking to address who owns that last mile when it leaves the store to get, and then gets to your kitchen. As you may have heard in October of 2021, FDA held a new business model e-commerce summit with over 2,800 people attending. There were 44 different countries represented and we all learned from each other. Common themes emerged and are being addressed. We know we need to continue to work with our stakeholders to make sure that this growing business model ensures safety of food. We will continue to partner with CFP and the USDA to promote the CFP's direct-to-consumer and third-party delivery guidance. We also need to know 
but we need to build relationships and partnerships with food delivery companies that we've never worked with before. We need to provide education through them on the importance of proper food handling, including outreach to delivery service, services such as the Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and the many, many others that pop up every week. And we acknowledge we need to learn more about labeling in an online grocery shopping experience. Next, please. As part of New Era, there will also be an independent review conducted of the entire retail food safety system to evaluate its effectiveness towards our public health goals and evaluate such questions as what are our current strategies in reducing foodborne illness in retail? How do we work together? What are we doing well and what can we do better? The thinking here is in a few key areas that are up on the screen. We need to improve our focus on using risk-based methodologies and root cause analysis in our inspections and our investigations. We need to consider how we can evolve inspections from activities that look just at food code violations to activities that incorporate coaching and education. We also need to assist with the implementation of well-developed food safety management systems throughout the retail food industry. As you all have heard, the results of the FDA risk factor study tell us that those facilities that have well-developed food safety management systems have fewer occurrences of foodborne illness. And then we need to implement interventions that positively impact food safety behaviors and practices. Next, please. So for the road ahead, we wanna to continue to capitalize on the successes we have had since last year, working with our stakeholders. You heard yesterday about many of the projects that the Association Collaborative is working on, and they can all be viewed on the Collaborative website. I encourage you to take a look at it. It really is an, a, a fantastic tool. We will continue to work with our collaborative partners to increase uniform adoption of the FDA food code by our state, local, territorial, and tribal retail food protection programs. I think, I think Steve Mandanak mentioned yesterday that the collaborative has developed a toolkit to help everyone navigate the food code adoption process. And you heard yesterday that CBC is also working on an assessment of state level adoption of specific food code provisions related to norovirus prevention and the relationship between the provision adoption and the norovirus foodborne illness outbreak rates. All of this will be up on the, food, on the association collaborative website. We wanna work with all of you to ensure that everyone is using risk-based inspection methods. And we wanna help address barriers to conducting these inspections Infections. And we have heard from our stakeholders that there's a great need to improve our outbreak investigations. So to that end, we will continue to work with our partners to provide trainings such as root cause analysis and CDC's foodborne outbreak environmental antecedent training. Recently, the collaborative announced a new resource library that provides retail food regulatory professionals with a collection of vetted resources that support effective foodborne illness outbreak investigations. I encourage you to look at those also. And lastly, working with CFP and others, FDA will continue to promote food safety culture and food safety management systems within retail and food safety food service establishments. We want to share and increase the use of novel intervention strategies that positively impact food safety behaviors and practices. And that's why this seminar is so important because we learn from each other about all of these things. The country is so large and we're all doing such a great job out there. But I think our problem is that we're not able to communicate everything that we do and learn from each other. So we come together at seminars like this to learn and share. And the Association Collaborative is a great place to get involved and to share the great work you're doing so that we can spread it out to everyone else who's doing very similar work to you. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And we will see you all next year. And I really look forward to seeing everyone face to face next year. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Liz. Um, and do we have any questions for Liz? I'm not seeing any in the chat right now. Um, Liz is very accessible. Feel free to email her with any questions, as well as reaching out to one of the specialists in the Southeast, myself or Cameron Wiggins or Dan Reddit. Um, so thanks, Liz. Well, let's move on to our next topic. Let me get out of this presentation and go to the next. Um, our next speakers are going to talk to us about the future of, oops, future of um, 
environmental health and especially food safety. Uh, who's gonna be working in the future? Let me pull this up. There we go. And share my screen. Okay, so yeah, the future of the environmental health workforce, especially um, our food safety workforce, I, I think I can speak for everyone, both industry and regulatory, that it's been a struggle the past um, several years in filling positions, in getting new staff uh, into our programs. Um, and, and that's true in other positions as well. But let's focus on just, just our, our career path. And so um, we've invited a couple of uh, experts on, uh, that are involved in accreditation programs for environmental health. And although I certainly recognize that this is not the only pathway to our careers in food safety, it, it is a place to start to find out what, what are they seeing uh, in new students coming on board, these Gen Xers. And what can we do on our side to entice more people to come into the field that we have so much passion for? Um, so I'm, I'm just truly delighted to, uh, to introduce our next two, the next two speakers um, from academia. I've, I've known both of them for more than 20 years and worked with them uh, in different roles. And um, first of all, we're going to go over first an, an overview of each one of their programs at Western Carolina University and East Carolina University. Um, first to speak will be Geraldine Ralph with uh, Western Carolina University. Uh, Geraldine started at the local level, uh, as many of us do, and discovered her love of training and came back around to kind of her beginnings uh, back in the mountains of North Carolina, and she's now an associate professor in the environmental health program. And our second speaker is William Hill. Uh, William is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Thanks, William, for stepping up and serving our country. Uh, he also started at the local level, as many of us did, and he discovered his passion for environmental health in general. He's still very much plugged in at the local level, being on the North Carolina Board of Registered Environmental Health Specialists. He's an associate professor at the Environmental Health Program at East Carolina University. And I'll say this now, go Pirates, because you'll hear it from, from William also. So with that, let me turn it over to Geraldine to provide some context for their program. And then William will join us to go over their program. And please be sure to, um, and I forgot, go cat mounts too. I'm sorry, Geraldine. <laughs> Someone's reminded me of that in the chat. Um, so uh, we'll start there and then please put any questions that you have in the chat. And uh, once they go through their introductory pieces, we'll launch into a discussion. And I have some prepared questions, but I welcome uh, those in the chat also. So to get us started, uh, Geraldine, please, um, please join us. Okay, thank you so much. This is an honor to be here. Um, I, as Donna said, I did start in practice and transitioned to academia. And um, just wanted to share a little bit. Um, you're going to see me probably look at other screens. I am visually impaired. I'm blind in my right eye. So I have big monitors <laughs> um, that I view. And so if it's a distraction to you, I do apologize. But um, I need these accommodations to be able to do what I'm doing right now. So um, the first that we are doing is to provide a program overview. So some history of our program. Um, it's been around since 1977. And so when we're in our mid forties right now, and we graduated our first class of students in 1981. And then we were accredited a few years later and accreditation is very important. We were originally in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, which later combined with the Schools of Technology to become the College of Applied Sciences. 
and in 2007 was restructured to present um, our present day of uh, the College of Health and Human Sciences building. We are part of three programs in North Carolina that are accredited. Of course, there's ECU, WCU, and North Carolina Central University. And um, to the right, you'll see what has kind of governed us um, this whole time as far as the uh, what we do in environmental health and research is at the very center of this. Um, I am gonna be speaking to that later and would like to see that changed. So right now we have the Assure Competent Workforce for number eight of the 10 essential public health, um, environmental public health services that we have and research is in the center. Public health model has changed to equity being in the center. And number eight is to assure a diverse, competent workforce. And that is what we are discussing today. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our team. We have Dr. Brian Bird, Chad Halliburton, Dr. Hall, Dr. Duncan, and myself, Geraldine Raiev. Next slide, please. So an overview of our program, um, we kind of get into describing what environmental health science is because a lot of people um, are afraid of the sciences and they don't understand the application of the science, which we are trying to mitigate with intentional outreach. Next slide. From a curriculum perspective, we are a public health science program. We do require chemistry and physics courses, biology courses, including of course, microbiology and two semesters of math. We are guided by the accreditation requirements through the National Environmental Health Science and Protection Accreditation Council. Our environmental health specific curriculum is heavily weighted toward the junior and senior years. Each student is, is required to complete a 400 hour internship in environmental health practices. These internships are typically paid, some are not, um, especially in the rural areas. It's hard to, to get counties to have paid internships and have included work with IHS in Alaska and the Four Corners region, the CDC in Atlanta. Local health departments, industry, and even businesses like the NRC. Next slide, please. Taken together, our major is one that can serve many student needs. It is a major um, it is major that employer ready in the field of environmental health. Indeed, it is a preferred degree of the REHS credential. So in North Carolina and many other states, the REHS registered environmental health specialist or sanitarian is a professional credential, one reached after professional experience. And in North Carolina, a candidate is required to have employment experience as an intern prior to credentialing. If a student is a graduate of our accredited program, they are eligible after one year of experience. Any other degree and other, you know, there are other paths to come into this as Donna had mentioned, but any other degree must have a minimum of 30 hours of my own physical sciences and two or more years of experience. So education the same, but the years of experience differ. Our degree provides an accelerated path to full registration. Our degree is also a good, uh, it's good for pre-professional graduate school preparation. 
and is heavily rooted in the sciences and the close faculty attention provides good opportunities for undergraduate research and more. Um, the one thing I want to focus on for this particular slide is that there may be something in the works um, talking and speaking with Donna Coffey from the state. Um, she's trying to retire, <laughs> but I don't think we want to let her go. Um, there is some works to have that changed um, to where it may not be one year. So um, more to come on that, but it may be less than that for anyone that is um, graduating from the accredited programs. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, this, well, yeah, it was the beginning of this year. We just got our community engagement and service learning de designation. Um, it represents and is bestowed upon programs that engage their students both in curricular and co-curricular cap capacities. Try to align their expertise and research with public service initiatives and invest resources through community engagement efforts. These programs have made a conscious choice to invest in their community with the expertise and energy of themselves and our students. Our students are a driving force and want to be in the field, um, want to experience what it is to serve their community. So we definitely are very excited to be um, one of the, or the first here in Western North Carolina, um, at Western North Carolina to have this designation. And it's something that we've done for years and other programs in North Carolina, I'm sure have done it as well. And so if you have the ability to get that designation, I recommend in doing that, especially for recruitment and retention purposes. Okay, next slide. Okay. So air quality um, is a major environmental public health concern that we all share. And students in our program take an air quality control course and lab where they learn about the physics and chemistry of air quality. So again, it's all in the application of our sciences to try to help our students not be science diverse. And um, Dr. Dun Duncan, Sarah, she teaches this course and she integrates her own scholarship and research into the classroom and beyond. Next slide, please. Okay. Similarly, water quality is also a major environmental public health concern that we all share, as we all know. Kim, uh, Kim who is Dr. Hall, teaches the water quality control course and lab where students learn about water chemistry, aquatic microbiology, biology, federal regulations such as the Clean Water Act and more. These students participate in hands-on analysis labs and is um, part of the community service designation. Okay, next slide, please. We also have required coursework in food safety and sanitation. Students learn how to conduct regulatory inspections, learn about foodborne pathogens and intoxicants and study the regulatory codes. This is my course. Um, we are heavily into the uh, marking instructions, the food code, we go out into the field, not only on campus, but off campus. And I know other programs that are accredited do that as well. And I do bring my practical experience um, to the table to help our students get their feet wet and to be more work ready come graduation. Next slide, please. Let's see. A consistent theme across our program is that students are engaged both in the classroom and in the field. They are trained in surveillance techniques, microbiology, communicable disease control, risk assessment, and much, much more. 
As a faculty, we give all students opportunities in the class and lab, and we conduct undergraduate research with many of our students building on our own expertise that we bring to the table and our intellectual interests. And if you want to learn more, um, I have come into this century, <laughs> provided the QR code, um, and there are some links that you can access as well. Thank you, Geraldine. And, and now our, let's move on. Okay. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat, but let's move on to William's um, overview, and then we'll start addressing those. William? Good morning. What another beautiful day uh, <laughs> to talk about environmental health or food safety. I'm always excited to talk about what we do at ECU and what we do totally as environmental health. You know, on behalf of our faculty, I just want to thank everybody for this, uh, this great opportunity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> What we do, how we impact uh, the, our students, we challenge our students to prepare them for the future. They must be aggressive. You got to be proactive. Uh, we ask our students to think, think globally, but you can work locally. I mean, these, these are environmental problems or food safety problems. Yeah, they are global issues, but we can, we can handle those most effectively by doing it locally. What we find out from most of our students, they want to know how can they, how can they be a part of it. So this team of environmental health is, is something they can be a part of it. Our motto has always been educate everybody, uh, everywhere, every day. That's including now, right? I was, I was trained in environmental health. You educate wherever you can, whenever you can. So we uh, uh, put that on our students to have that kind of mindset that you got to get out. You got to be enthusiastic. You got to approach uh, this field of environmental health like, it, like it's life. And it is because we love environmental health. So one thing we uh, uh, demand of our students to be aggressive, uh, <clears throat> to be creative, and to build relationships. I think Donna told you, I came from local environmental health where a partnership with industry was crucial. So in the classroom, I'm constantly telling students, build that relationship with the folks that you are uh, uh, inspecting. I mean, de develop that rapport. It's gonna make your job a lot easier. You, you made a new friend and you're also protecting the public health. And that's all of our goals to protect the public health. So again, what we try to impart of our students is go out there and get them, you know, be aggressive. Next slide, please. It's what we do. You know, our core functions at ECU, food, water, wastewater, vector-borne disease. Although we teach, uh, we have an occupational health and industrial hygiene track, the core functions of ECU, uh, uh, and I'm glad to say, are generally the core function we find at most local environmental health uh, divisions. So again, we've got a great partnership in that we can teach courses in wastewater and food sanitation, as well as air quality and uh, vector-borne diseases. Next slide, please. Hey, if it's, talking about partnerships, Again, we hang our hat on our partnerships uh, uh, with local, uh, state, and federal agencies. Locally, <clears throat> Pitt County, which is where Greenville is, Pitt County uh, Environmental Health, provide internships for our students. And generally, that internship involves vectors, you know, identifying mosquitoes, collecting mosquitoes, but they're exposed to food in uh, child care centers, in nursing homes, in hospitals, at athletic events. So that partnership with local environmental health <clears throat> has, been critical, has been critical. And our, and our relationship with the state, the Department of Health and Human Services has been invaluable. That's a win-win for both of us. Uh, CIT training, centralized internship training uh, is required of all the environmental health specialists in the state of North Carolina. Enjoy how that works once you, once you are hired uh, uh, by a county and then they can send you to, to the, the uh, CIT training. Our partnership with DHHS is our undergraduate students can train or register for that CIT training as undergraduates. So once they graduate, you know, they can, they, they can be hired because they, that turnaround time is a lot quicker, right? So we, we like that idea of, of our undergraduates being able to sit and uh, work for this uh, uh, centralized internship training. Again, it, it gets them out in the field quicker, which most local health directors love. Plus it gives our, our program a little more clout, right? So we, we like that idea of partnership with, with other agencies, uh, particularly locally, and I can't say enough about our, our relationship with the folks in Raleigh and the CIT training. Uh, next slide, please. It's so what we do. Uh, we, we are in a, an aggressive program. You know, I was trained to be an aggressive environment health specialist, and aggressive in meaning being proactive, right? educating whoever will listen and whoever won't listen. That's always been our attitude, man. And one thing I, 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 we want to say about our faculty, one thing that's, that's so good about our program, our faculty, joining uh, our officers, and give presentations 
to local state uh, environmental health agencies uh, across the state. So we, that's, that's, the, that's a win-win for us. And on our uh, uh, curriculum advisory board, we have retired environmental health specialists. We have uh, a current environmental health specialists looking at our curriculum, looking at our syllabus to make sure we're teaching what the environmental health specialists in North Carolina need when they get into the field. So we like to expose students to that. Without a doubt, one thing we do at ECU, if there's a, if there's a, a, a holiday that's related to food or water or air or vectors, we are on it. So again, World Environment Health Day is next week, right the 26th. We've already planned on what we're gonna to do to educate students at ECU about World Environment Health Day. And we'll cut out a part uh, related to food safety. So again, I uh, wanna expose students to all these areas of environment health. Uh, and this last bullet down here, ether, that's environmental health training and emergency response. Uh, that's disaster training. You know, we have a one hour course that we teach in the spring talking about food safety during a disaster. We wanna, we wanna prepare our, our students to uh, look at food safety, you know, in the good times and in the bad times. Generally what I tell students, you gotta have a heart to work in environmental health, but you'll see people at their worst, right? So that not, might not be the time to, uh, you know, bring the hammer down. But again, you gotta be understanding. Right? Uh, Again, you just have to be when it comes to environmental health. And that goes a long way of promoting our program and again, getting the public to recognize that you know, we aren't the enemy, we're people that you can, uh, uh, you, can, you can depend on. Let me tell you a quick story. Listen, uh, I can remember early in my environmental health career uh, going out to a site and the lady was saying, so are you the help man, H-E-L-P? I said, no ma'am, I'm from the health department. She said, oh, I'm looking for somebody from the health, from the health department. And that's what it was. She was saying health and I was saying health but it's the same thing, man. We're there to help people, right? So I always remember that story when I'm talking about environmental health, that we are there to help people, whether it's food, whether it's water, but right now we're talking about food. Right, next slide, please. Yeah, man, talking about the future. Oh, that is today. We're talking about that, that was yesterday. One thing that, again, I, 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 I constantly beat up my students over here with is you got to communicate, man. You got to have that personal approach. So during the pandemic, we had to kind of step back a little bit. So that communication you had with the regulators or with industry or with other environmental health specialists was kind of put on the back burner. The future now is let's get back on, let's get back on the road, right? Uh, although we're not totally out of the pandemic, again, we can see some light and that light should tell us we need to continue to educate. We got to get the word out and that's everywhere. I'm talking about that church function. I'm talking about that, that uh, a backyard barbecue. One thing we tell students, you are always on duty in environmental health and food safety. Hey, man, there ain't no breaks at this, man. You're going to the football game, going to the concession stand, look for that grade card. All right, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, talk about the future. The future is getting out and educating everyone, right? And to talk about environmental health and food safety, not just for, uh, for restaurants. How about the food out in uh, Carolina Panthers uh, football game or Atlanta Falcons uh, football game? There's food there. So again, I think as we expose students that this food safety is more than just, you know, the little mom and pop restaurant, and I'm not hating on that, now, but we need to inspect them and, and develop a rapport with them as well. But this thing with food safety and environmental health is huge. So again, I want to give them a global view, but again, you can work uh, locally uh, in environmental health. Uh, the future of environmental health is being visible. If it's a state fair, a county fair, uh, it's a summer program, uh, uh, if it's a, uh, 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 any kind of party, uh, retirement party. Oh, that's always cool, man. Retirement party, uh, you know, get all this food, uh, people that are bringing in. Well, if you're an environmental health specialist, you're on duty again, man. So, hey, uh, just look around and make sure that everything is safe. So the future of environmental health, to get back out there, get as aggressive as we were before the pandemic and educate everybody. And uh, one of the, the, the things that we, we love most is community colleges or high school uh, uh, guidance counselors, right? We need to promote our, our, our program uh, the numbers of environmental health in, in North Carolina, you know, are going down and we need environmental health specialists in the field. Uh, that's why our relationship with the state, uh, 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 environmental health folks uh, go a long way of us getting environmental health folks specialists out in the field as quickly, as quickly as possible. And then when they get in the field, it's time to go to work. Right? So we train them to, to, to hit the ground running. Once you leave ECU, once you train by the local environmental health division, uh, get out there because people are depending on you. Next slide, please. Yeah, man, tailgate them. I'm sorry, I think we went, went up one, Donna. Might wanna go back. Yeah, tailgate, oh, I'm sorry, same slide. Yeah, wanna talk about this tailgating. Again, I tell our students, you're always on duty. You're an environmental health major. If anybody should have a STEM thermometer in their purse or on their book bag, it's gotta be you, man. So my, I generally tell them, when you go to the tailgate, 
you know, just take your little thermometer, wipe it off with your little alcohol swab, check the temperature real fast, put it back in and keep on going. And we're always on duty. And this is a great opportunity to educate on what we do because somebody's going to ask, what are you doing? So now you can talk about uh, food temperatures and food handling and food storage. Again, got to be aggressive, got to be proactive. Again, we constantly tell our students, that's got to be your attitude when you get out into the field. Got to have the attitude, man. The attitude is you educate everybody. Got to have the aptitude, man. That means that you have educated yourself, so now you can be the local expert. The last thing we tell students as well is you got to have thick skin, man, right? Working in environmental health, you're going to deliver some unfavorable uh, uh, news from time to time. But again, you can't get, get blown out of the water about that. Or get your little feelings hurt, man. We ain't got time for that. We got to protect the public health. Your feelings hurt, man. Pick them up, man. Go back to the office, man. Get some coffee. Come back the next day ready to rock and roll. That's how we do it in environmental health. Next slide, please. Yeah, man. From the farm to the fork, whether it's the transportation, whether it's a food processing plant, there's always an opportunity to educate. So again, want to give this student this, uh, 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 this wide vision of what you can do in environmental health particularly as it relates to uh, the food safety. Consider this, man, uh, high schools, you know, generally there's a culinary arts class. That's the old home economics class for, for, for those of, of my age, right? But again, that's an opportunity to educate, right? Uh, 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 sign up as a guest lecturer, as a guest speaker. Uh, go to career day uh, at the high school. Uh, uh, go to the guidance council, just talk one-on-one. -on -one. one thing that I really like about our program is if there's something in the news related to environmental health, we're going to talk about it. This morning, I, was, I saw about uh, pouring cough syrup on chicken. Yeah, we know that's crazy. <laughs> but look, that's an opportunity to talk about <laughs> the proper cooking temperatures of chicken. That's an opportunity to talk about proper thawing of these, these things as well, right? So there's always an opportunity to educate. There's always something in the news related to what we do. You got to grab that, man, and use that as a talking point in your class as relates to protecting the, the, the public health or careers in environmental health. Again, there's always an opportunity out there, so you gotta be aggressive. That's kind of been our little mantra for years. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, man, that's me. We are heroes in environmental health. That's always been my attitude and the attitude I was trained that people are depending on you. You are the local expert. Act like it. How do you act like it, Mr. Hill? By educating yourself and educating the people that you are, that you are regulating. You know, at ECU, this RMAC, or, or sort of almost 25,000 meals a day, I kind of found out. What we do in our food sanitation class, it's been a couple of years ago, food sanitation class, we have our students sit for a presentation from these folks that are preparing food for the, for the students on campus. Again, that's a job opportunity. Yeah, that's an internship opportunity. But more than that, man, it's an opportunity to, to educate and see how other folks are doing it. This is a team approach as we talk about environmental health, as we talk about food safety. Again, talking about our swagger, I mean, that's that attitude that you call me, I am there. You got a question about it. If I don't know the answer, I can find it back. But that's, that's you and your cape on. That's Mr. and Mrs. Environmental Health. That is Mr. and Mrs. Food Safety there. Let's get that swagger back, man. Let's get that, that, that attitude back that people are depending on us. Then let's do a good job. You know, Maya Angelou said this to me properly. She said, people, uh, uh, I'm counting on you to count on me, right? You're counting on you to count on me. That's our attitude in environmental health. I know people are counting on me. So students, as you get out into the field, Make that worthwhile, man. Make, make, that, make that valuable time. Get that swagger back. Get that attitude back. Get that aptitude back. And hey, don't worry about your little feelings getting hurt, man. That's going to happen. That's, that's par for the course. But this field of environmental health, particularly food safety, I mean, it, it is a, a, a field that we need to talk more and more about, not just academic, not just uh, industry, not just FDA. It has to be a collective approach if we're going to grow the next generation of environmental health. So look, put your cape on, man. Listen to your theme music. Da, 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 da. That's your theme music. Look, create your own theme music. That's what I do, man. Create your, your own theme music. Get your swagger back, man, and promote and protect uh, uh, the public health through food and food safety. Next slide, please. Uh, I think the question was about um, uh, retention or hiring uh, 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 new employees and new students. And we tell our students, you can be part of a team. You know, you're not going to be out there uh, 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 alone, right? And although you're regulating facilities that, that the state of North Carolina said you have to regulate. There are other, other, other food uh, facilities that you can just stop in and say hello. I generally talk about their church function. Yeah, you know you go to church, man. That church function where everybody's making food. Well, hey, you are the local expert. You have the environmental health degree. You have the food safety, safety training. Then volunteer to be in charge of that, to make sure all that food is transported to the church safely. There's always opportunities out there. What we challenge students is 
find that opportunity to educate or create that opportunity to educate, man. I mean, middle school, right? High school, there's opportunities there. Again, if we want to hire the next generation of uh, environmental health specialists that's got that swagger we're talking about, right, with that cape on hand, we got to get out there and, and, uh, and promote what we do. Next slide, please. Talking about, you know, uh, yeah, talking about uh, retaining environmental health specialists. Uh, this, for me, I, I'm thinking the, uh, the future looks bright. One thing I know about uh, environmental health specialists is I always try to stay, uh, stay in tune with what we're doing in the state of North Carolina, uh, is, is uh, uh, cross-training environmental health specialists. You know, you could work in food for so many years that you might want to take a break and work in another area. At least offer that option for our um, environmental health uh, practitioners that have been there for a couple of years. Consider this too, uh, provide some assistance, right? Environmental health specialist, environmental health supervisor, program director, you might want to go to graduate school. Okay. May I not, may I take this time to talk about ECU master's program that was designed and geared for working people in the field. Yeah, check us out. We have an environmental health certificate, right? In our master's program uh, uh, for additional education, if employees, if environmental health specialists choose to do that. So we want to retain these great folks in environmental health, man. I mean, just good people in environmental health. We got to do something to entice them. And that enticement might be just a, a matter of providing some assistance to go back and get an environmental certificate or get it in, uh, a, a master's degree. Another way we're going to retain these uh, great folks in environmental health is update our meetings, man. I hadn't been to a meeting in a long time, so maybe it's changed. But again, you got to make it fun, man. You got to share those war stories. We've all got great, great, great stories about food safety and, uh, and industry and environment and health. Let's share those in some of those meetings. Matter of fact, won't you just have a meeting just to talk about war stories, right? And then uh, maybe some upgrade on some, uh, some global issues as it relate to food and food safety. One thing that I've been, <clears throat> that I like to talk about to my students to talk about global issues, but look, you can work here in Greenville, man, and, 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 and handle that problem locally, right? Give students a little um, uh, insight on, on, on these global issues that they're doing and take advantage of these employee skills, man. You got employees that's been working in environmental health for years, got a lot of good skills, man, but we don't, we don't use those as much. Give this last story, man. Uh, we had an uh, employee when I was an environmental health supervisor. She was an artist. Matter of fact, you can see some of her artwork in downtown Newburn, North Carolina. When I found out she could draw and was an artist, oh, she came up with a coloring book for environmental health. Uh, it was a, uh, a hand-washing book, right? Real creative type of uh, characters in it. So if you want to retain uh, and keep these great employees that we have in environmental health, take advantage of their skills, man. And you're not going to know that until you uh, 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 hang out with them, find something personal about them. Again, the whole idea is I need anybody and everybody to help me to promote food safety. So whoever that is, man, hey, I, am your, I am your boy. You know what I mean? So if you got some skills that we can use in environmental health, we want it. We don't care who gets the credit. We just want to make sure that we're promoting and protecting the public health. Uh, the way we need to and the way we should, should. again, retaining these, uh, these great folks in environmental health, uh, I think that's critical because we're losing a lot of wisdom when these folks retire. So we can bring them back to use them uh, as guest lecturers in our classroom, right? Or maybe they can help find internships for environmental health. So we like that idea of, of uh, uh, how we can retain these great folks. Next slide, please. Yeah, man, hey, I know this is a... Uh, a crowd of food uh, industry folks, but hey, I was trained to take every opportunity to educate. So hey, this is my this is my opportunity. We heat all leftovers rapidly. The end. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, William. And Geraldine, if you will come back and join us again, let's go over a few questions. Uh, <laughs> I feel re-energized now for hearing from both of our speakers about. You know, the experts that we are, I, I think we're, we're probably all a bit tired <laughs> after the pandemic. And, and we needed that reminder of, no, we are the experts. And, and we've kind of, I think we've kind of forgotten that in, in the past. So um, I do want to bring up just a couple of the questions. And um, William, you already, you talked about this a bit about how can we get people involved um, in our career field, whether you're industry or, or in uh, regulatory. Um, what can we do specifically? And Geraldine, I'll send this to you first. What, what can we do to send people to local health department? This was a question in the chat about, um, you know, maybe the, having the master's degree kind of routes people to a, a different level, to a 
local state level or to a federal level, um, what can we do to support more folks going to the local level? Geraldine? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So what we do here is our, our internships are really a driving force for getting our students out on the local level. And we don't have the master's program. We have the mm -hmm. bachelorette program here and they go, all their internships, I mean, they go as, to Wake County, they, they go all across um, North Carolina as well as other states. I, I need to put that in as well. So um, we are mostly a regional institution, but um, everyone wants our interns and not just ours at Western Carolina University, but anyone that's from an accredited program because of the shortage that we have um, with people retiring and what Will was saying, the main driver to, to get these uh, students into local government is to be a good ambassador of our programs. So the people that are out in the field, we need to be good ambassadors. We need to be speaking highly of our profession and carry that passion, carry that fire with us um, to attract diversity and, and um, and hold them, hold them in environmental health. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get an opportunity to discuss the other presentations that we have or? We, we, we may not, Geraldine, we're um, kind of short on time, uh, oh. but time well spent here. Um, yeah. and, and folks can always reach out to both of you. I've put your contact information up on the screen. Um, and William, back to you. Uh, Geraldine mentioned, mentioned diversity, and uh, diversity is a gap in our workforce. Uh, we recognize that. Can you say what you all are working on um, as far as more diversity of students coming into your program and thus coming into environmental health? Yeah, one, one of the great things about our program, uh, Donna, we got a, a, diverse, a diverse faculty. And I, it had all our meetings, I tell, I tell our faculty, we got to run with that, man. We got to use that, man, because students see that and they always coming on that. But uh, Jody mentioned about the internship. That, that has been great uh, 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 to expose our students to diverse situations, diverse jobs. However, you're talking about diversity of people or cultures. You know, we've we got a, a, a standing invitation on a lot of the fraternities and sororities and groups around campus. And one thing that our uh, interns do, one of their requirements is once they complete their internship, they are to give a PowerPoint presentation to the incoming uh, freshman or sophomore or junior, just to expose them to environmental health, you know, at that, uh, at that level once they uh, sign up to attend ECU. So that diversity is critical. Uh, the internship has been great. Uh, one thing I would love to see is internship uh, uh, from a lot of folks in the industry. Because the regulatory folks, I mean, we, we get those internships. And being an accredited program, students get great internships. But I'm, I'm from the local level, man. So I, I would love to see, you know, a local internship at uh, maybe one of these uh, franchise places. And last thing I'll say about the local environmental health, there is no better training anywhere in the world that you're going to get as local environment and local health departments. But you're dealing with the public face-to-face. -face. You're not going to get an email. You're not going to get a text. They're not going to send you a, a, a little TikTok video. They come into the office to talk to you about your decision. So you got to be ready to communicate that effectively. At the same time, that's another opportunity to educate on why you made that decision. So we always promote a local environment. One last thing, if I didn't talk about this already, Donna, uh, bring local health department, a local environment health specialist to the classroom or to your open house. Again, so students can talk to them one-on-one -on, -one on what's the day in the life of an environment health specialist in the food section uh, at Pitt County Environmental Health. So students love to hear from uh, environmental health professionals that are working in the field. Okay, thank you, William. And, and just a note that um, this is such a, a robust conversation and there's so much unanswered uh, still and we, we're running out of time. So I'm gonna add um, a regional chat thread um, to the, um, to the conversation, to the regional chat thread uh, for conversations under the, the conversation tab. 
for you all to continue this conversation. I'll try to do that during break so we can keep going with this because there's a lot of important information here. Um, just in summary, um, I, I think some key points that we've made here is uh, relationships are essential with our community and our partnerships with our community, including um, you know, our local regulators, our local industry people um, in the community in which we, we live in order to support food safety, the future of food safety, and to promote our profession. Um, and, and personally, I think my, my big takeaway is let's all take time for what we now consider maybe a fluff thing to do or a nice thing to do, not necessarily um, mandatory work. And that is to take time to go and visit uh, that university and talk to a class. Uh, go ahead and take time to visit uh, your local high school and talk about your profession. Go ahead and talk to the guidance counselor and, and do what we can do personally within our own communities to talk up this field because typically it is a field of discovery, right? We didn't all grow That's up right. saying we're gonna be health inspectors. It's something that we kind of fell into, but we all need to promote it and get back to some of those nice things that we feel like we don't have time to do anymore, but they're really essential for investment in our future workforce. So I wanna thank our speakers, Geraldine and William. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and, and please both of you, uh, go to the thread that I will start under conversations in Southeast and continue the chat with our experts here. And with that, let me turn it over to Cameron and he Thank will you. introduce our next speaker. Thank you, William. Thank you, Geraldine. Good morning, everyone. And thank you. And what a way to start off our Southeast session breakout, right? Uh, given a charge, let's put our capes back on. Who's ready to put your cape on? <laughs> I see you, I see you, Kim, and definitely. And, and our next speaker, let's keep that energy going with our next speaker. Our next speaker needs no introduction to the Southeast. She's, she's been around with us for a long time. She presents with us generally every year, if not every other year, but uh, she always has something great and awesome to say. Uh, Kim Libsey is a Senior Emergency Response Coordinator in ORA, Office of Human and Animal Food Operations. She spent over 20 years at the Federal Service with FBA. And you'll see Kim at just about every large incident, uh, every inauguration, every special large special event, and she's on the front line. She's usually the incident commander. Hurricanes like Katrina, Rita, Gustav, uh, Irma, she's been at the GA Summit, the Democratic and Republican uh, political conventions, uh, presidential inaugurations, and recently at the World Games, which we're gonna talk about today, a little bit about that, as well as uh, she was uh, on the ORA incident management team most recently uh, with the powdered infant formula um, uh, adverse event. Uh, so with no further ado, Kim, I'll turn it over to you. And I hear you got something special for me in the presentation as well, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm gonna have Cameron uh, to help us out today. So Cam, just stay ready. As Cam said, um, or Cameron said, we did work uh, the World Games, uh, which occurred in July of 2022 in Birmingham, Alabama, with the Jefferson County Department of Health. So this presentation, and wait a minute, before I get started, was William, Oh my gosh, uh, we need him everywhere. You know, typically, you know, I, I'm pretty uh, confident in presenting. You know, I, I don't have a problem coming behind somebody. But I was thinking, oh man, this dude and all this energy, I don't know about this this morning. But uh, that was just a, a great encouragement because, you know, we really as a um, discipline got beaten up, uh, especially during COVID. You know, it was an attack on public health, environmental health. Uh, what have you. So to hear somebody with that much passion, uh, just very much appreciated, just appreciated. So, but we have 30 minutes, now we have 24. So we're going to go ahead and get started. But today we're going to talk about a uh, SEER 1 event that occurred in Birmingham. So this is going to be a collaborative effort to ensure food safety and food defense at a special event. So we're going to talk about what that looked like.
Okay, so just to give you some background on the World Games, um, for one, um, I had never heard of this and neither had Cameron. We didn't know what the World Games was and I don't think Jefferson County, our partners that we worked with there had any idea of what it was either. Oh, wait a minute. Is my screen shared? Okay, you guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Something happened on my computer. So I was like, wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. So um, the event was from July 7th through the 17th. It was a SEER 1 event. So um, a SEER 1 event, uh, and we'll talk about that, what that entails in just a moment. It was a 11 day uh, global multi-sport event, uh, the World Games. Uh, the first one occurred in uh, Santa Clara, California in 1980. And so this one was originally scheduled for 2021 because uh, the World Games uh, occur after the Olympic year. So due to COVID, it was postponed until uh, 2020. So this is an event that's recognized and supported by the International Olympic Committee. And there were some of the officials who actually uh, attended the event. And it was also broadcast internationally. So um, it, they had some really interesting um, sports. I'll just name a few. Uh, they had sumo wrestling. That was a big draw. They had um, street skating, flag football, uh, drone racing, uh, which was interesting. And I think the one that was most interesting to me was orienteering, where somebody literally takes a compass and run through the woods. So it's some type of navigation sport. So a lot of unique sports um, for this particular event. Hey, Kim, we may need you to share your screen. Okay, so it did stop. Okay. That's what I thought. I think it kicked off. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry guys, but yeah, I thought something was going on and I thought somebody said they saw it. Okay, so do you see background? Yes, we see you. Okay, all right, so sorry about that. So yeah, so the background on the World Games, you know, kind of just went over it but just some very unique um, sporting events that took place. Okay, so I said that this was a, a SEER 1 event. So basically what that means, it's an event of significant national or international importance that may require extensive federal interagency uh, security and incident management preparedness. So uh, for NSSEs, you know, Cameron mentioned in, in my introduction, that we do a lot of NSSE, so things like inaugurations, political conventions. A SEER 1 is just a step down from that um, designation. So for SEER 1s, uh, we have a federal coordinator that uh, is put in charge of federal assets. In an NSSE situation, all federal assets are brought to bear and that uh, United States Secret Service is, is the lead. In a SEER 1 event, um, state and local law enforcement are typically the lead, but we do assign this federal coordinator who's the lead uh, planner or the lead point of contact for the state and locals. So the host counties uh, for this particular event were Jefferson County. They had the majority of the uh, venues and the activities were held there. And then Shelby County, uh, another county in Alabama had uh, one venue. So you can see the demographics on, on these host counties. And so FDA was invited to the party by uh, Jefferson County. So they provided us a request for assistance in October of 2021. And the, the primary assistance that they were seeking is with food protection activities. And when we talk about food protection, uh, we're talking about food safety and food defense. So. Um, protection from unintentional contamination, food safety, and protection from intentional uh, contamination, food defense. And they also uh, requested that we provide ICS support. And that's something that we have been doing in recent years, um, making that available uh, to these jurisdictions that are requiring our assistance. But the main focus and the, the main, um, I guess, resource that they want are our retail food specialists because of their expertise. So they have years of experience with large scale special events. And now we have also years of experience with these events as it relates to the incident command system. So what did we contribute? 
So FDA uh, provided staff training for Jefferson County and also the Shelby County staff, also food defense training for the inspectors and for the uh, food service establishments, uh, venue assessments were, and we'll talk about that a little later, also supplier verification. So we had Jefferson County uh, collect a list of all the suppliers that would be providing food for the event. And so uh, part of our uh, supply chain verification is we look at uh, what's the compliance history for these particular facilities that will be supplying the food. Have they been um, had to issue a reportable food registry where they had some type of contaminated food product? Have they been involved in outbreaks or uh, FDA recalls or USDA recalls? Uh, have they had any type of adverse events uh, reported through our CARES program? And so we do that verification and also it's for FDA regulated firms that are supplying uh, the uh, event, but also for our USDA uh, regulated firms. So we share the list with USDA and we go one step further. We also share the list with our FDA division of food defense targeting. So they're our uh, group at FDA that's looking at um, and getting intel on possible intentional contamination events. So they also looked at that supplier list to make sure none of those suppliers were um, involved or, or there's intel related to them as it relates to intentional contamination. So we provided also six retail food specialists to actually go out in the field and conduct monitoring during the event. And then two of our consumer safety officers who were uh, checking, uh, receiving that was coming in during the middle of the night. And then we provided seven command and general staff members for the incident management team. And one of those was remote, but everyone else was in Birmingham in person. Okay, so this is a, the World Games org chart, I'm trying to get my laser. Okay, so this, for the overall event, this was their organization chart. So they had a unified command. So they had a member from the city of Birmingham that was a unified, one of the incident commanders in unified command. And then they had a representative, Jay Caston from the World Games. And uh, initially we thought this was a person that the World Games had brought in so that they were coming in, um, that this was an international representative, but actually no, this was a person um, who lives in Birmingham. He's involved in a lot of different things in Birmingham and he was chosen to be the lead for the World Games. So he was the World Game representative. And then they had deputy uh, commanders. So then I mentioned before that because this is a CIR-1 event, we have a federal coordinator uh, who is identified. So our federal coordinator for this particular event was Patrick Davis. He was uh, the agent in charge for the Birmingham um, Secret Service uh, Division or office in Birmingham. And so then he also had a deputy federal coordinator. This was Kirk Toth. He was with our Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. And he uh, brought to bear a lot of the training for the law enforcement that was uh, involved. So active shooter training, uh, uh, bomb detonation and, and bomb training and different um, trainings for primarily for law enforcement, but also incident command system training because some of the people involved uh, did not have that training. And then you can see below the other uh, federal agencies that were involved. So you had other uh, agents from United States Secret Service, the U.S. Marshals, FBI, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office. We had uh, ATF, um, Homeland Security Investigations, ICE, and CISA. And so you may notice that FDA is not listed there because uh, we weren't a federal agency that was pre-positioned. We were invited to the show, if you will, by the Jefferson County Health Department. So we uh, fell with Jefferson County because we were going to be in unified command with them. Okay, so for the um, command, you had a command staff and then you had the general staff. So they had an operations section, they had an intel section, and you know, this is a, a CIR-1 event, so you have a lot of national and international engagement. So this event could be a target for terrorism. So you definitely want to be um, gathering intel and you know, listening and identifying with diffusion centers to make sure if they were hearing anything. Uh, related to this particular event. So they had an intel section, 
planning section chief, um, logistics section, and finance admin section with, with chiefs. So for us, um, operations section was led by uh, Chief uh, Lori Stoney. She was a local person uh, with the city of Birmingham. And so then our, um, she had fire medical branch, law enforcement branch, public works and transportation who reported to her. And underneath the uh, fire medical branch, you had these uh, various groups. So the public health group fell within operations under fire medical. So we were represented here with the Jefferson County Department of Health um, on the overall structure. Okay, so with this event, you know, there were various meetings. Uh, we had food safety and defense meetings that started. Well, let me say this. Well, on previous slides, I showed you that we were requested, our assistance was requested in October of 2021. So by November of 2021, we started having food safety and defense meetings between FDA, um, our leads, which was Cameron and myself, and the Jefferson County Department of Health. So Cameron led, <clears throat> excuse me, led these meetings. And we started out meeting monthly. By January, we went to biweekly meetings. For that operations section uh, that Chief um, Stoney was the lead, they started having operations section planning meetings weekly. So we joined the meetings along with the Jefferson County Department of Health uh, in December of 2021. So we had those meetings weekly up until the event in July. Uh, unified command meetings. Uh, so that was that entire structure. You know, we were only a small group within that large structure. So we weren't actually invited to that meeting, but we weren't getting a lot of intel. So we asked uh, Chief Stoney if we could uh, join that meeting in listen only mode. And so Cameron and I in the uh, Jefferson County Department of Health joined those meetings um, so we could hear what was going on at that higher level because we weren't getting that level of detail in the operations section meetings. So we started in uh, January of 2022 uh, listening in on those meetings. Then in May, we transitioned from the food safety and defense meetings that Cameron was leading to our command and general staff planning meetings. So we went ahead and had identified our um, staff and Jefferson County staff that was going to be a part of our incident command system. And our command and general staff for our IMT uh, began to take over meetings. So we transitioned uh, from Cameron and uh, Janice Covington, who was the um, one of the program supervisors that was assigned this particular event. So she was our point of contact. So we transitioned from them trying to gather all the intel and get the information. And we turned it over to our operations section chief and our, and our operation deputy and, and Cameron to get that information. So that freed Janice up because she was going to be incident commander with me in Unified Command. So it freed her up to take care of uh, the other things besides all the uh, minor or my, well, all the um, extensive and minute details of operations. And then in um, June, 2022, uh, you'll see as we go through these slides, uh, we had some challenges related to volunteer meals and first responder meals. So we started meeting with the um, World Games um, representatives related to volunteer meals in uh, early June. So we started having weekly meetings with them uh, related to that. And then there was just a plethora of ad hoc meetings that we had to do in order for proper planning. Okay, so who's involved in these types of events? So you have, you have your athletes, their coaches, uh, the general public, you have volunteers, uh, medical staff, um, the uh, international officials like the IOC officials, uh, regular uh, work crews, first responders, which is key. And of course, all the media is going to uh, kind of um, con converge on, on, on the area. And then you have the uh, local officials, the, the mayor and uh, the city councils and all of those officials. And then our uh, food safety um, operations and, and the employees that are working in these operations. Okay, so for this particular event, you know, uh, there was uh, 17 different venues spanning uh, Jefferson and Shelby County. So this is just a map. So all of these, in the red here were within uh, Jefferson County and then the small one where you might see at the bottom, Oak Mountain, that was um, in Shelby County. So we were um, providing food monitoring at all of those uh, 17 venues. But in addition to that, 
we were also um, monitoring and making sure that the food was safe for athlete meals. And, and they were being prepared at the Birmingham Southern College and the University of Alabama, Bir University of Alabama Birmingham um, campus. So those were the athlete meals. So we definitely, we don't want somebody to come uh, from other countries and come here and not be able to compete because they got food more notice. So that was key. Uh, so athlete meals, we had athletes night was just a, a one night special event at the Jones Valley Teaching Farm. And so uh, they were preparing a meal for the athletes and it was this hog that you may see to the right. So these are just some pictures from the time it was hanging in the cooler raw till they cooked it on the grill and then they um, actually uh, ripped it up with gloves on uh, for service. And they actually did a really good job with this. And I don't know if you guys ever watched the Food uh, Network, but Rodney Scott is, I think, a judge on one of the barbecue shows. This was actually uh, his establishment that provided this hog uh, for Athletes Night. There was also opening and closing ceremonies that we had to cover, a welcome affair at the Birmingham Museum of Art that was covered. Uh, hospitality areas at all of those venues and then various caterers um, that uh, we covered, international media areas. You definitely don't want to make the media sick. And then the World Games Plaza, um, they were calling it City Walk Birmingham. It was actually under uh, the highway, which was a um, security nightmare, I'm sure. I can't believe uh, the secret, United States Secret Service allowed it, but they did. And it was a really uh, cool um, venue, but uh, they had uh, 50 plus artisans, food vendors, and food trucks that were at that uh, particular area. Okay, so what were our priorities? I already mentioned it was the athletes. Uh, it's the first responders, because if you can take out the first responders, you make the entire um, event um, vulnerable. So we wanted to make sure their food was safe, that the delegates and dignitaries that were coming, the international teams that were accompanying the athletes, and then the media, because you don't want to be on the five o'clock news having gotten one of them sick. Uh, this is our um, incident management team. So we were in unified command. So uh, we had our ICs, our agency executive group was made up of Jefferson County, Alabama Department of Public Health. And then Liz uh, from FDA was our agency executive group that was uh, providing the overall priorities. If we had any kind of difficult situations, we would have taken it to that agency executive group. So the team was uh, mixed with FDA and Jefferson County Health Department um, in key roles. And then this was our operations section. So we had an FDA personnel with a deputy from Jefferson County. We had Cameron, he was over charge of our continuous monitoring groups. So these are the groups. Um, so that was where we were doing the athlete meals. Uh, Sheraton was one of the major hotels, Sheraton and Weston. And then at the uh, Birmingham Jefferson County Convention Center had a number of venues. And so we also did continuous monitoring there. And then we had our team, Mercy Chefs was for our first responder um, caterer, and then various teams that were doing spot checks and checking uh, the different hospitalities, the, caterers, caterers and restaurants. And team receiving was our FDA CSOs who were checking trucks at night. And then team Shelby was our team that was in Oak Mountain. Okay, so this is just gives you a picture of our incident command post. So we were set up in a conference room at the Jefferson County Department of Health. Uh, this is our team. You may be able to see Cameron to the far left. I think this is me here. So we had incident command here. Operations was on the side. This was our safety officer, and this was our planning section. And in the back, uh, we had a unique setup where the they have a department operations center for Jefferson County, and so they wanted to track the staff uh, going out into the field, and they wanted to shuttle them, you know, because of you know traffic jams and for safety and different things. So in the back, we primarily had logistics, and uh, so this is a young man who's uh, running a T-card rack where he's tracking when our staff were shuttled out to the various venues. You can see we have TV, so we're watching the games and they also have uh, a um, list of the uh, shuttles and different people that were going out. And so this was primarily logistics in the back. And so then this is from another view. 
you can see, so this is what we had. We would have the planet P. We had a uh, T card rack where we were checking in our command and general staff personnel in and out. We also, this was, we were getting ready for a briefing. So we were sharing the IAP on the screen. And then we had a uh, spreadsheet of where our people were located. So because as incident commander, you know, in case something happens, there's an explosion, you need to know where your people are at all times. So this is how, and th uh, this is, you can see a better picture of operations now. So operations would put this on the screen so we would know at any moment where our people were. Okay, so our operational period for our incident management team, and this is a this is our first operational period. So we had uh, our op operational period briefing, because we had two shifts, we actually had to do two. So we uh, from June 29th to July 18th was the time that we activated the uh, first part of that. The first week from 6:30 to 7:5 was remote. So we wanted people to understand what their roles were. So we activated remotely. Then we deployed um, down to uh, Birmingham on the 5th of July, and then had our uh, first operational period in person on the 6th. So we were doing one week operational periods and most of the staff were working anywhere from 10 to 12 hour shifts for the field staff and about the same for the um, incident command. So uh, just give you some numbers, total food operations that we were responsible for. We had 45 plus caterers or restaurants and they were providing food for the hospitality areas, the media, uh, special parties for foreign representatives, first responders um, by default, uh, volunteer meals and some emergency operations center meals. We also had uh, 39 temporary food permits. They, those were primarily for the merchants market. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Uh, and food trucks that were not returning to the commissary because food trucks were already permanent. But if they weren't going to their commissary, which is part of the permit daily, then they had to get a, a temporary permit for this particular event. Then we had 54 food trucks that were operating on their per uh, regular permit, seven venues with um, in-house concession kitchens that had to be checked. And then for the athletes meals, we already talked about the two colleges, but also um, some athletes based on the time of their particular sport couldn't get back and forth uh, to the UAB and BSC kitchens. So we worked out uh, a situation, Donna and I got called to the carpet. Uh, we had to go meet with the uh, Secret Service and the World Games representatives about these particular meals. So what was suggested is that uh, they provide uh, non-TCS uh, meals um, for those athletes who could not get back because we're in Alabama, it's hot. They really didn't have a way to hold foods um, hot or cold. So uh, this was the um, what we came up with. So that so you can see, um, you know, checks mix, you know, high protein tunas, beef jerky, and things. But I will say they got tired of that really quick. I, I, one um, at one event, they actually ordered pizza, and pizza, the pizza truck drove onto the venue. I, I couldn't believe that they got in, security let them in, but they drove into the venue with pizza. Okay, so this was the World Games epicenter. So um, this is where they had the merchants market. So you had the different merchants selling like jewelry and different things, and also the food trucks. But um, this was the main epicenter for the event. So we had uh, City Walk was about 10 blocks. Um, we had events at the Convention Center. The Sheraton Hotel was here, the Western Hotel. So these were the main hotels uh, for the delegates and other contingencies that came in. Protective Life Stadium is the football stadium. So that's where we had opening and closing ceremony. Uh, the Batwell Auditorium had three events. The Birmingham Museum of Art had a welcome affair and then also World Games Plaza. So this is this area is under the expressway. But it, it was it turned out neat. I mean, it, it was pretty cool. Scary, but cool. OK, so what activities um, did we do? So pre-event activities, um, there was a special events questionnaire that was shared with um, the different um, restaurants or operations that were providing food for the particular event. And so this was to gather information on uh, what were they doing. 
you know, what were they planning to do at the facility? Did they have the proper equipment to do what they were planning to do? Did they need to bring in any additional equipment? So what was their capacity based on their plans? You know, uh, also gathering any information on what they were going to be serving, uh, their production times, uh, when uh, during the event, because this was an 11 day event. So all the venues didn't run simultaneously. So when were they going to be operational uh, for their particular uh, event? Uh, there was also a food defense assessment done. And then um, the pre-event operational site visits where they actually physically went there to get all that information I just discussed in one. And then um, they did conduct a um, like a one mile radius of that TWG epicenter. So they made sure their um, inspections were up to date. And they also um, did an inspections for those, the Sheraton and that Western Hotel. So uh, another part of the pre-event activities was training. So we provided um, these trainings to the food vendors. So they had a food truck summit. There was a volunteer food handling that, um, so that, that was online that people could take. There was food defense awareness and food protection training. And then uh, for the staff, uh, we provided managing retail food safety at special events. Uh, there was a food defense awareness training they attended, communication and safety. These were some of the trainings uh, provided uh, through CISA or CISA. Uh, we did a special uh, planning peak workshop the week before we were going to uh, stand up because a lot of people didn't have actual experience in ICS. So we went down and did a hands-on training. Uh, and then the other trainers listed on the screen because my time is running out. So this is World Games by the numbers. There were about 3,500 athletes from 99 countries, 23 venues and 34 sports, about 375,000 spectators attended during that 11 day event. We had 3,000 volunteers providing Southern hospitality and about 32 delegates from national, uh, from the IOC and from other sports organizations. And we had a number of, um, I never could get the numbers of first responders that we had, but we did have uh, local, state, and federal representation uh, from first responders. This is just an idea of the uh, schedule of the various venues. So operations really had a challenge trying to figure out, okay, which uh, venue is operating today? You know, how many people do we need to send out? So they did an outstanding job keeping up and, and making sure we had coverage for these various, um, all the various of those 17 venues. So event activities, we did continuous monitoring, which means we were there the entire time for the um, venues that are listed on the screen. So we talked about the athletes meals, the Sheraton, and Mercy Chefs was our first responders meal. So this was key uh, that we um, had to have that continuous monitoring there. And then for the welcome affair for athletes night, we just did continuous monitoring the days they were prepping for those particular events. So it was a risk-based focus, only um, foodborne illness risk factors is what we were looking at. So to the right, these are just some of our inspectors that um, this was during COVID. And so we had, it was, um, Birmingham was in the high at this time. So our inspectors were supposed to be wearing masks. So I'll just let you look at that that uh, they wore masks when they left the incident command post is what I could say. And so even here, this is one of our inspectors. She doesn't have a mask either, but at least she is outside. But it was so slammed with um, all the food prep and everything that was going on. We even had some of our staff pitch in and actually help um, the first responder caterer. So other, for the other events uh, that were not under continuous monitoring, we did spot checks. So basically looking at the same thing, but for shorter periods of time. And those were for the um, different caterers and the markets and food trucks that you see on the screen. Still, the focus was risk-based and uh, you know the frequency of how many spot checks they got was based on their risk and their demonstrated compliance during the actual event. So this was the monitoring form we used. We were just looking at risk factors you know, it was in, out, uh, N, A, N, O. There was a second page that where they could write uh, temps. But for this one, it had the risk factors and they would denote whether it was in or out. And these were NCR copies that we could leave with the uh, part of the team. I mean, not the, well, with the um, facility. Uh, we also had, they were having marshalling yards for this event. They were supposed to, all deliveries go through 
this um, exam um, examination and um, they were supposed to be coming in at night, but they actually came in during the middle of the day too. But we had people checking them when they came at night. And then during the day, the um, investigators or uh, retail food specialists invest and uh, inspectors that were there would check them upon arrival. Other activities, uh, we were monitoring recalls, make sure we weren't serving recall food. There was a record review of restaurants um, because we were having issues with the volunteer meals and the first responder meals, uh, the event organizer would just start getting restaurants to send food. So we'd have to scramble and make sure we were covering those restaurants that were uh, sending food. So some of the challenges uh, with the continuous monitoring, you know, it was long, stressful days. There were incorrect meal counts. With the, um, at the facilities providing the food for the athletes, the athletes were eating more than they um, had planned for. So they were having to run out and get more food. And so then, you know, um, the stress of having to prepare this food and get it out there, you know, so we really had to monitor what they were doing as far as temperatures. Uh, we had COVID-19 positive diagnoses and exposures that kind of, um, at, it was near the end, thank goodness. So that kind of had some of our team members had to be pulled from the field and be put in quarantine. Event security was softer than expected, and we had the deliveries at various times. So these are just some pictures. This first picture is one uh, some of our um, investigators and, uh, re and uh, retail food specialists was at one of the athletes' uh, meal uh, ca uh, cafeterias, and the door wouldn't lock, and they didn't lock it because they couldn't hear if somebody came to the door. So we had to, and there was a environment that was kind of hostile. So we went out and talked to them and they did put a panic bar on the door and they put a buzzer on the back of the door. So, you know, they were trying to be proactive uh, for the middle. That goes back to uh, not their numbers changing daily and having to get more food and making sure the uh, temperatures were cooked. Uh, for the vegetables at the bottom, they had them wrapped in microband um, cloths. So, you know, those contain chemicals. So they had to be discarded. Uh, this is the one I wanted you to help with, Cameron, but I'm behind time, but they wanted to cook these roasts, um, I think, overnight, so over 12 hours. So we recommended, well, we had them cook it per the food code. And then this was some sausage, uh, kind of neck use sausage. They wanted to do a um, charcuterie board with the sausage, but it's raw, and they didn't want to use the consumer advisory. So we had to uh, call our USDA counterparts to ensure that it was a raw product, and it was, and so we had them pull that. They decided not to use it. And then other challenges, this was one of our biggest challenges, the first responder volunteer meals. Um, because this was the city of Birmingham's first, uh, I guess, foray into a CR1 event, uh, you know, there was a learning curve. So the one of their churches, mega churches there, wanted to help out uh, with these volunteer meals because uh, people just couldn't step up. You know, the price of food is high. So we didn't have anybody... Uh, kind of to step up to do the uh, resp first responder volunteer meals. So, you know, that was a constant thing. Who's doing these meals? We need to do an assessment, all of that. So they finally landed on a, the church got a disaster response operation, Mercy Chefs to do these first responder volunteer meals. And they were basically doing it at cost. They were just providing them uh, groceries, the, the cost of their groceries. So uh, this was a huge challenge for them because uh, the meal count was frequently changing. They had setup issues and the uh, setup was supposed to be provided by the World Games or the city of Birmingham. Uh, they were using volunteers. So having enough volunteers was a challenge. The meal choice they chose, you know, they're used to doing disasters. So that becomes a challenge. And then also because some of the first responders didn't like the meals that uh, were being provided through this company, they were going, um, to the uh, college campuses trying to eat. And then also um, we, they had to start using restaurants to provide food for first responders. So this is just a, a setup of Mercy Chef. And I'll just note on the right, they were getting trolled on Facebook uh, based on the meals they were providing. The first responders were highly upset about the meals. And so then people were uh, kind of trolling them about this mega church providing this, um, what they considered bad food for the first responders, you know, so that was a challenge. And I actually ran into the, the head of Mercy Chefs in the elevator and I was like, oh, I know you. And he was like, 
how do you know when I said, oh, I'm with the FDA? And he said, oh, I'm your problem child. So he was really beaten down. And it was sad because, you know, in a disaster, they're serving food and people are just grateful to get anything. But that's just not the case with a special event. So he really was trying to do a, a great job. And I will note that he loved Cameron, though. He said Cameron was great. Cameron had worked with him. And so it was it, it was great to hear. And then our accomplishments, our goal was to provide uh, this food protection at this event. Uh, there were over 200,000 meals served and there were no outbreaks. So we did meet our goal. And we did also observe a decrease in violations as the event went on and a growth among the food service staff. And I'll stop there. Great job, Kim. And awesome with the, uh, the World Games as well. I want to jump right in because we did have a few questions and then we'll get them in and go to a break. Uh, one question was, does FDA typically coordinate with the state food program for large events like this? Well, Jefferson County had the uh, jurisdiction. So we worked through Jefferson County, but for our food safety meetings that I talked about that Cameron led, we did have the state there as well. So um, the state was, you know, we offered up if they wanted to assist, but uh, we went through the county first and then included the state. Awesome. And, th and this is an independent county, I will note. Birmingham is independent from the state, so that makes it unique. So I'll just quickly say in past events, I think when we uh, worked with Florida, we did go through the state and then down to the locals. Okay, Ken. Absolutely. And one last question. Um, did you limit menus to minimize risk factors? Well, Ken, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, a, a lot of the um, menu items were very simple. Uh, a lot of the um, the universities wanted to keep with the meals they were normally preparing uh, for their students. Uh, so not a lot of, um, you know, um, odd oddities, except for maybe like roasting the pig. We really focused on that, making sure they had good, um, uh, good protocols in place uh, and, you know, definitely um, uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, everyone had good um, employee health policies, especially, you know, what are they doing in terms of COVID uh, uh, to protect our uh, EHS as well as um, uh, others that are going into the uh, restaurants to do the inspections. And uh, just making sure they had the basic protocols, you know, all of the risk factors being addressed, that they have a policy, a procedure for how to make sure they did that. And we asked about the menus to make sure we had an idea of what they were serving, how it was being served, how it was coming in, and how they were controlling it during the uh, entire event. So um, great job, Kim. Uh, thanks again. Um, we're going to go into a break, and we're going to come back at about 11.50. Um, and so uh, there'll be some uh, brain teaser activities to, uh, if you want to stay on, um, but go and grab something to eat, drink, or, uh, you know, use the restroom and come back about 11.50 and we'll start about 11.50 sharp. Thanks. Just one more thing. You can all just um, mute. Um, don't log out of the session if you're coming back. Uh, especially speakers, don't log out and come back. Just stay in the session. Just um, just block your video and un and and uh, come back after the break. Thanks.
Okay, everyone, um, we apologize for the short breaks, but uh, we are wanting to have a, a very robust conversation and plenty of time for our speakers to get, get through their, their topic and share their expertise. So um, we appreciate you being patient with our shorter break. Uh, we will have another break uh, in a little bit, so um, we'll, but we'll, we will adjust that one um, based on what our speakers need also. So uh, let's move on to our next um, topic. Let me share my screen. All right, and and is thinking about it. So let me go ahead. Asset plan review. Um, this is a topic that um, you all adopted a later version of the food code and you started taking a closer look at, um, at HACCP plans. There were a lot of questions, uh, you know, with This is a topic that was actually at uh, the top of our evaluations from last year. So we I'm sorry, I've got a pop-up that says my Zoom has quit. If I could get um, back up from our tech support to share the slides. Hi, Donna, I'm gonna share the slides now. Thank you, Olivia. You're welcome. Okay. Um, All right, so let me go ahead and start introducing everyone. Um, it's no, it's not just our terrible internet. There's uh, there are always gremlins at work during this. Okay, so yeah, so this isn't a technical session on you know what is this aspect of, of, of curing or smoking? What is the critical limit in, in certain scenarios? This is more of an overview of what is the process for reviewing HACCP plans in different states. And what have they learned over um, a period of time? And what is next for being more timely with reviews, um, finding expertise to assist, you know, finding those PhD microbiologists to assist with the technical parts of that. Um, so this is really the, the overview process itself. Um, so let me introduce our speakers. And again, I'm very delighted to introduce folks that I've known for quite some time. Our, our first speaker that is going to kind of give us some background on the program in North Carolina is Jennifer Moore. Uh, Jennifer comes from the local level. She is now uh, at the state level in North Carolina as a regional environmental health specialist. Uh, and she is the chair of the North Carolina Variance Committee. Uh, she is a Tar Heel. And um, I've spent, spent a lot of money at Chapel Hill myself, so go Heels. And so she's going to um, provide us an overview first. Our second speaker is Sean Bryant. Uh, Sean is the Food Service Program Director for Environmental Health Section at, of uh, Georgia Department of, of Public Health. And she's um, overseas. Uh, food facilities in over 159 counties there. Uh, Sean has experience in both Georgia and Tennessee and began her career at the local level. Our third speaker is Matt Johansson. He's the retail special processes coordinator for the Florida Department of Agriculture, Agriculture and Consumer Services. 
Uh, he has uh, almost a, a decade of food experience. He started his career as an inspector and uh, accepted a position as uh, the retail processes coordinator in 2018. And um, finally, John Wheeler. Uh, John Wheeler is the Pro special processes team lead for the food program at South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Uh, he reviews uh, HACCP plans and um, for retail as well as dairy and manufactured food. Uh, John has a bit of a different background. He's from the lab. He's had almost, and, and I'll just collectively say, 40 years of experience uh, in food in one aspect or another, um, including food microbiology and chemistry laboratories. And I must say, John, you ask the most highly technical questions of me that I get from anyone. So um, let's start off our presentation with Jennifer to provide some background. After uh, John finishes, we'll then open up the floor to questions. Please put your questions in the chat uh, while they are speaking, and then I'll facilitate those at the end as well as some uh, prepared questions that I have. So Jennifer, go ahead. Hey, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, whoever's advancing slides. I'm going to give you all a quick background on the Variance Committee. So we were, let's see, that's not, oh, uh, that's not quite the right slide. Let's see. I'll go ahead with it though. Okay, so our uh, Variance Committee in North Carolina was established in August 2012. That is when North Carolina adopted the 2009 version of the FDA food um, code. And we have recently adopted the 2017 version of the food code in October of 2021, which has made the variance committee job a little easier. Um, we actually, uh, for an overview, we request that local health departments keep HACCP plan approval documentation. And you know, now under the 2017 code, we have uh, certain processes that can the HACCP plans can be evaluated by the local regulators and approved. So that has lightened the load of the Variance Committee. Prior to our adoption of the 2017 code, all those things came to the Variance Committee. So the numbers were a little higher. Uh, we, I don't really have statewide totals for like how many HACCP plans are approved in every county or even across the state. That's something that's lacking. I would like to see us get, get uh, better information out there. But at this point, I don't have those numbers. Our HACCP plans reviewed per year varies quite a bit. It, it varied a lot from the, the years prior to our adoption of the 2017 food code. And I'm gonna show uh, some numbers on that in a minute. We actually have, this committee is, is local and state regulatory staff, food scientists and academia partners, and then some industry partners also join in. And I get asked a lot of questions about how we make it work. I, ha I do not have a microbiology background. I have a biology degree with no microbiology, so go figure. Um, but that's what I have. And I just became the chair of the committee by a fluke or maybe by being foolish enough to take it. I don't know, but I work hard to help everybody work together. So I look at myself as more of a communications and people person. And I do review HACCP plans and I've learned a lot um, doing that these last several years. And if we could go to the next slide, I want to see if my numbers are on the next slide. No, I don't know what happened. Um, sorry, y'all, my slides for my notes are out of order. So we have subcommittees to review sushi requests or rice acidification. We have, uh, we have subcommittees to review equipment variance requests because we get into uh, variance requests for use of two compartment sinks or dumpster pad exemptions, that kind of thing. And we do have an administrative assistant who has been trained to review and approve those equipment requests. So that helps us out a lot as well. And let me look at my notes really quickly. Go to the next slide, please. I'm trying to hurry through my intro. I know we want to see. No, now I think I'm getting into the questions Donna's going to ask. So I'll just say this about the numbers. In 2019, we had 30 new variants requests for specialized food processes. 
And then in, I don't count 2020 because I, I don't know, I lost track of numbers or didn't count or something. But 2021, we had 26 new variants requests for specialized food processes. But then in 2022, so far, we've only had 11. So that's the drop from us adopting the 2017 food code. Now, we have um, probably close to a thousand or more equipment variances across the state. And those numbers do not include our um, sushi rice approvals because we have those uh, separately. They're kind of, they're kept separate, kept count separate from the others. But I think that that is kind of just a basic overview for y'all to see how we operate. I will say this also, the, the people that submit their request have to submit the full request for variance form and the HACCP plan if needed for their request. That has to come in all complete in order. Thank you, there's the slide. In order for us to, to um, move their, their request to our agenda, we meet monthly, the third Tuesday of every month, which is today. So I had to cancel the variance committee meeting today so that I could join in, which is kind of ironic. But we, we do monthly meetings and then we do other correspondence by email and work with operators. We try not to deny if we can help an operator come up with a way you know, to make their, their process work within, within safe parameters. We direct them to other things and help them with research and that kind of thing. It's a collaborative effort for us in North Carolina. So I will stop with the introduction part now. <laughs> Hey, Sean, uh, if you would join us now, please. Yes. So uh, thank you, Donna. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our HACCP plan, or I'm sorry, our HACCP review program in the state of Georgia. So if you would just go to the next slide for me, uh, right before that one. Thank you. So I started in 2016 as the HACCP and variance program consultant. So actually our very own Cameron Wiggins, who is now with FDA, he hired me into that position. And so our HACCP and variance program consultant is dedicated to nothing but HACCP reviews. So any type of HACCP um, request or any type of variance request that comes to the state office, they are the person that receives that request and then they review those and um, for the entire state, essentially. And so with that said, um, I reviewed those, but let me just clarify in that particular position, the person is dedicated to HACCP invariance reviews, but that's not their sole position. So the HACCP invariance program consultant does have other duties that they're responsible for. So that program consultant does do standardizations, they do um, trainings and other things um, in that position and in that particular role. So since, um, since I did serve in that position, I have since 2021 transitioned into a promotion for the food program director. I have about six years of um, HACCP and variance um, together. Um, Mostly during that time, I've reviewed a majority of reduced oxygen packaging um, plans because that's what we typically see in Georgia. We don't see a whole lot of um, other specialized processes, but we do get a lot of reduced oxygen packaging, and that's what I pretty much review. So out of the reduced oxygen packaging um, plans that I do review, the majority of those have been cooked chill. We do get some sous vide. And um, besides the reduced oxygen packaging, I have reviewed some fermentation. I have reviewed um, acidification and some canning, but I am very green when it comes to uh, fermentation and canning. I will tell you, I'm not the most familiar with those. So in my current position as um, the food program director, I do have three program consultants that work directly up under me. They each have their own specialties, but we do have one dedicated to HACCP and variance reviews. Um, as I stated, when I transitioned into the role of food program director, um, essentially that person that we hired to replace me, she basically 
um, fell into that position and she is now responsible for reviewing all of those HACCP plans and um, variances that come to the state office. So in her role, she still does have standardizations and trainings that she's responsible for too. So it's not a full-time um, dedicated position to HACCP and variances, but she does review what we do have that comes to our office. Um, our rules are based on the 2013 food code. Um, and we adopted the 2013 food code back in 2015. And so um, with that said, when the HACCP invariance uh, position was created, I should kind of piggyback um, for when, when um, before I even got to the state office. Before I even got to the state office, this position was probably created back in, I think, 2007. So that's when we were on the 2005 food code, I believe. And so we adopted the 2013 food code back in 2015. And so now, um, since we've been on that food code, we've reviewed probably about three to five plans in a year. And, and with that said, um, those plans come in infrequently, kind of like what Jennifer said, they do vary. But in a typical year on average, we get about three to five plans a year. Um, we currently have about 11 that are approved statewide. Um, our HACCP plans are reviewed um, in two ways. We go through a state review process and we go through a joint review process. The joint review process is done, done on the local level where if we have a facility that is restricted, let's say a mom and pop that has a HACCP plan or a special, specialized process that's restricted to just that particular facility within that district, that single district, we will assist the local um, Board of Health with a joint review process there. But if it's something that impacts the state statewide, multiple districts, multiple um, jurisdictions, then we will uh, review that at the state level. And then we have a technical review committee that we do um, have should we need the technical guidance. And that's made up of our um, FDA retail specialists, um, our sister agencies, Georgia Department of Agriculture, along with academia, which is University of Georgia and some of our environmental health specialists. So that's our program in a nutshell, Donna, thank you. Thank you, Sean, that was a great overview. Uh, and now Matt Johansson from Florida, would you provide us with an interview, uh, excuse me, an overview of your program? Sure, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Matt Johansson and I am the Retail Special Processes Coordinator for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Food Safety. My primary responsibility is to review all special process applications for all of retail for the state of Florida. Uh, next slide, please. The Florida Department of Agriculture has adopted the 2017 food code. However, we do not use the term variance in relation to special processes as the state has a different legal definition for this term. As such, the department was required to change terminology. It is for this reason that Florida uses the phrase special process approval or SPA in place of variance. Another point of terminology that might that we use that might may be different from other jurisdictions is that the state does not approve any special process materials, but rather we accept them. This is an important distinction in that we are not taking ownership of these materials and or saying they're without flaw, but rather after a thorough review, we accept that the applicant has met the application requirements. The state of Florida first started an in-depth special process review program around eight years ago with the adoption of the 2009 food code and was expanded by my predecessor in 2016 to its current structure. It has been streamlined to promote efficiency while retaining a premium on accuracy. For each review, I look over the entire submission from start to finish to best try and catch anything I might have missed in a previous review. Each pass is another opportunity to fine tune the applicant's submission to ensure they, are, they will be operating with the best possible plan. Florida does not utilize a variance committee or other group structure for reviews. I'm the only person doing these special process reviews. To keep everything in order, I utilize a first in first out queue system and keep everything logged on a spreadsheet. This allows me to see who has submitted and when, what order they are in the queue, and if I'm waiting on additional materials and if they've been accepted. As I'm the only person who conducts these reviews, I one, I do keep rather busy, and two, 
We do have both an administrator who acts as a final review before the material is accepted. And we started the process to train a backup to me in the event that I'm out for an extended time or I win the lottery. Next slide, please. Uh, since I accepted this position in late 2018, in a typical year, I'll receive several hundred inquiries into special processes. But of those, I will, I will roughly uh, see 40 to 60 applications. Of those who apply, I will accept on average about 35 per year. As of right now, I have received 43 applications and have accepted 28 of them. Next slide, please. Turnaround time varies depending on how many applications are in the queue and the complexity of each one. If I'm caught up and receive an application for something relatively simple like custom animal processing or ROP per 350212, I can turn it around in about a day. Having said that, I'm rarely caught up and I'm sometimes assigned different projects in addition to my reviews. So the average turnaround is about a week. This includes the time it takes to get to the application and the time it takes to review it. Rarely do I receive an application which is immediately ready for acceptance. So the average time a highly motivated applicant waits from first submission to final acceptance is typically about three weeks. In addition to reviewing all new applications, I also work with establishments wanting to amend their already accepted plans. This could range from adding a new location, changes to ingredients, or adding additional items. This process goes much quicker as I'm only reviewing the material that has changed. While the number of amended acceptance letters is not tracked, I would estimate I amend approximately 20 to 30 per year, with most of those being for new locations. Next slide. And if anyone has any uh, questions or like to reach out to me, my contact information is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, that was a great overview of your program. And yeah, fingers are crossed that you win the lottery. <laughs> me first, though. All right, now finally, John Wheeler with South Carolina will provide us with an overview of their program. So we have some context of where everyone is. John? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, South Carolina DHEX food program uh, adopted the 2013 food code in the summer of 2014, uh, which included the regulatory basis for our special processes program. Uh, I was hired uh, in October of 2014 based on my background in food science and in the food industry. Uh, I was hired to create that special process program. Initially, uh, uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Um, initially, the only guidance we were able to provide was textbook HACCP, um, but that was not working. It didn't take long to figure that out. There was a lot of resistance. Uh, Q&A trained chefs and other retail operators were and are not prepared to understand HACCP much less how to write a plan. So we had to find ways to simplify the process while also providing some basic instruction. Next slide, please. We began creating HACCP templates uh, for each type of process that we encountered routinely. Uh, this was essential to provide that guidance uh, start to finish. We now have 18 HACCP templates for various processes, including hybrid models. Uh, which we provide to customers based on the triaging discussion to determine their business needs. Uh, we had to shift our approval process to a review and educate model. Over the course of 2020, uh, during the pandemic, we developed re retail food industry friendly HACCP workshops to formalize that mentoring approach. Uh, a couple of the key parameters uh, in developing these workshops was to keep the instructional portion, segment one, as short as possible, focused only on one process category of interest, to be respectful of their time and, and to let them absorb as much as possible. So each workshop is focused on either reduced oxygen packaging processes or curing processes. Um, then the second segment focuses on the thought processes for writing each required component of the HACCP plan start to finish using our templates as the format. But above all, our goal has been to foster uh, partner relationships with the individual operators uh, and with college level and high school uh, vocational culinary programs. With our state culinary colleges, we have so far initiated two collaborations to integrate HACCP education and active managerial control into their curriculum, beginning actually next week uh, and then next month, uh, two different formats. Next slide, please. 
So this data represents only HACCP plans from 2018 to present. There's really no data there for 2020 and 21 because of the pandemic. The special process is pretty much we're not happening during that time for us. Uh, the processes here uh, the represented cover all the ROP processes, a number of curing processes, a few acidification and fermentation processes, and cheese making at retail. For non-meat acidification and fermentation processes uh, here in South Carolina, we only require a variance SOP covering the required critical control points and critical limits. Uh, as of right now, we have over 200 approved HACCP plans statewide. The data here shows a 38% reduction in the review and revision cycle from the receipt of the application to the, plan of to the time of plan approval. We believe that's been driven by the use of templates and our mentoring approach, uh, as well as our industry workshops. And I will comment that uh, prior to 2018, we had not been gathering this data, but on average, uh, the number of reviews was running about six per plan before approval. Uh, so as of now, we're looking at just about three uh, revision or re review cycles to complete a plan. So that reduction of effort uh, coupled with the mentoring and partnering approach has been really key to gaining industry buy-in. Next slide, please. In 2021, we hosted three workshops, two for ROP processes and one for curing processes. We're following the same schedule this year uh, with the third session of this year having kicked off yesterday for ROP processes. Uh, in 2021, we had 31 industry participants, and counting our current session this month, we've had nearly 70 industry participants this year. Uh, we've had more than 60 retail establishments or culinary education programs participate in these workshops, uh, and this year those are including uh, folks from other states. Our volume picked up sharply from the pandemic levels beginning in April of, of this year, second quarter. So the data here for all the lines, uh, we expect to significantly increase by the end of the year. Um, we have a number of plans right now that are nearing completion. So those numbers will be bumping up. The percentage of HACCP plans to total special process approvals has increased by 25% this year compared to 2019, and it's up by 57% over 2018. Next slide, please. So where we want to go from here, uh, we want to continue especially to build our partnerships with the college level culinary programs, as well as the South Carolina public school vocational programs. Uh, we believe that building these partnerships with the retail food industry is essential to reducing the fear factor that is associated with HACCP and to working with regulators. We need to develop our image as a vital resource, not just the food police. Um, so educating these new chefs is a key to changing that existing dynamic, and we are all in with that initiative. And that is my summary. Thank you. Thank you, John. And if uh, everyone would come back on screen, please. All our presenters. And Olivia, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, um, I have some pictures I just wanted to show and um, just we'll go change slides every so often. Um, so I'd like to go through a, a, a few prepared questions that um, we've talked about and, and is important for this group to hear. Uh, you've all provided the context of where you came from. And, and John, you've touched on what you've learned so far and where you're going next. Uh, but let me start with uh, Jennifer. Uh, what have you done since the beginning to make your review process for, for industry especially? We have our industry partners in the room. What have you done to make your review process more efficient and timely? Because um, you know we didn't start out perfect, did we? <laughs> No, and we are we are far from perfect even now. Let me tell you for sure. Um, I I did not say all of this in my overview, but I want to to kind of clarify that I joined the state staff in October 2014 with a very rural uh, background background at a very rural um, local health department. So I had no experience 
with specialized processes. And other than a barbecue restaurant that vacuum packaged barbecue that we just ignored because we didn't know what to do with it. So I had no experience. I was asked to sit in on variance committee meetings and very quickly got kind of put on the committee and then the chair left and the branch head at the time and I worked together. But my job responsibilities, I cover 10 counties in North Carolina for training and you know, working with interns and county assistants and rule interpretation and that kind of thing. So the variance committee is just an added part of my job, but it does take a lot of time to coordinate everything. And I am the one that receives the request and the phone calls and the just in general keeps communication going. So I hope as far as helping what, what we've done to make things more efficient, my ability to communicate with the operators and help them through the beginnings of finding templates and um, communicating with the local health department as well. Like maybe if the local health department has somebody on staff that's familiar, that's my favorite slide ever right there <laughs> in the whole world. <laughs> I use it in every presentation I can. <laughs> but I try to work on that communication so that an operator does not feel like they are shuffled around to different people. I just take on the the middleman part, I guess you would say. Um, and y'all, I have two really annoying dogs in here and they are probably gonna bark. I'm so sorry, but I don't know why they're barking. But I work with operators one-on-one uh, -on -one like that to help them so that they're not sent somewhere that, and they don't know the questions to ask and that kind of thing. So I feel like that has helped. We receive requests um, through email. They don't have to be, you know, paper copies, snail mailed to Raleigh, that kind of thing. Uh, Which is how it started was with the paper copies of everything and the committee having to have that pa those paper copies. But we we receive digitally now and we, re we communicate through email most of the time. I can't believe these dogs. Hush. So we we work with the operators to get them where they need to be. Um, I take on that responsibility quite a bit. We use Microsoft Teams for meetings now. So we move more efficiently as a committee because people who might not be able to travel to physically go to a meeting, we can all join in on Microsoft Teams. And we we have a lot of experts that help us. And um, Jonathan from South Carolina, we have spoken in the past. I've spoken with Sean in the past about things. Galen, uh, Baxter, we, we have had, we just coordinate with different people in different states to find out the, mo the best information for the operators. Mm -hmm. And we just work together as a team. All of our members on the committee are charged with reviewing the HACCP plans to the best of their ability. Everybody's not an expert in everything, but if they will, you know, review it to the best of their ability and then come into the committee meeting to discuss it, we have other experts that join in. And I cannot get, I cannot be done with this without saying the North Carolina Variance Committee would be lost without Veronica Bryant's expertise. She's been on the committee almost from the beginning. She is just to, in my opinion, just such an asset and a treasure for North Carolina for the special processes world. And then Dr. Ben Chapman, our committee could not function without our NC State partners. Dr. Chapman has been on this committee also, I think from about the beginning and his team now joins us and helps us with meat fermentation and uh, kimchi and sauerkraut and all those things that we are not experts in. And that is how we have tried to improve our efficiency and work for the operators. Thanks, Jennifer. And Sean, uh, same question. How have you in, in kind of improved upon your efficiency and timeliness with review um, from the beginning? So what we've discovered in our state, we, we listened to our partners because we found that there was a lot of back and forth they, they were frustrated by the process. There was so much emailing back and forth. There was confusion about what the expectation was from the review process. Yes. So many, in, even our environmental health specialists didn't understand what documentation did we need in terms of reviewing it for, for the HACCP. 
So we created several things. We put several things in process for, um, for HACCP. So we have a HACCP review checklist that we utilize for our environmental health specialists to utilize. That is for them to understand what documentation that, that is the, what is the expectation for the operator to have in terms of documents. So the operator has a specialized process that they're conducting on the, the local level. So what they know they need to implement a HACCP plan because of that. So what documents do they need to su support that, that HACCP plan? So we created this checklist so that it will prompt the environmental health specialist to be able to discuss this on the front end. So they know they need certain SOPs. They know they need a HACCP worksheet. They know they need flow charts. So this HACCP, this HACCP checklist basically outlines all of the documents that we need as a part of that process. So now the environmentalist can have that discussion at the local level to educate them so that it can eliminate a lot of the back and forth. Because a lot of times we were receiving one pagers because mm -hmm. they did not understand what they needed to support their HACCP plan. They just knew they had a proposal, but they didn't know what they needed as a part of that process. And then outside of that, when um, they did su submit a complete package, we would follow up with meetings. We would um, send out concern letters. So after we reviewed it, we can outline what problems that we have with the process, uh, what you submitted in those documents, in those flow charts, in those SOPs. So what concerns did we have? So now we can set up in-person meetings, virtual meetings, all of that. Because sometimes you lose the message with the concern letters and the emails, all of the back and forth. But if you follow up with an in-person meeting and, and, and any type of communication that you can provide to them and be available, that really helps them in the process. And I know we received some positive feedback from them because of the simple fact that we have these open lines of communication with them. So I think that's been really good and made our, uh, our process very efficient and robust because of that. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Sean. So I'm hearing you say you've helped your local staff by creating this, this checklist yeah. and also improved your communication with industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Matt, how have you um, made your pro review process more efficient and timely and robust? Well, when I came on board, the review process was already rather efficient, efficient the review itself. So what mm -hmm. I did is I worked on streamlining the periphery. So that'd be like the introduction in information. So I received several hundred inquiries per year. So mm -hmm. what I did was I made up a Word document that had all of the introduction emails that I, I could think of for all the different processes. And mm -hmm. so the process comes through for whether it's certification or ROP or making jerky of any kind, then I just have to copy and paste that perf that um, that uh, template into an email, mm -hmm. and then I also have a folder that has each of the processes and the, and the documents that go with those. So I just copy and paste those documents in, and I send off the email that way. Um, that process, when I first took over, I'd, I'd be sitting there 10, 15, 20 minutes trying to type up an email, mm -hmm. find the documents mm -hmm. I wanted. This way now, I've cut it down to you know like a minute or two. So it helps cut back on that aspect of things to afford me more time with the actual review itself. And same thing with the acceptance. Uh, I've got template acceptance uh, letters and template acceptance emails. So again, okay. just type in what, you, what you're looking for, or I'm sorry, you personalize uh, in what, uh, the, the section that you're looking for, and then you just copy and paste and, and go. So that's, that's where we've gone with it. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so it's really the administrative um, improvements that you've made so you can spend more time on the review process itself that have helped exactly. you all. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And John, you've, you've touched on this, but can you um, provide us with a, a summary of what are the, the big efficiencies that, that you've made in your um, review process? Sure. Uh, the templates are a huge help, huge help. Uh, Matt mm -hmm. mentioned our Sean mentioned checklists. Uh, we use the templates as a checklist in reviewing plans. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ideal when the customers will use the template. Um, it gets more complicated if they go to some other source. 
um, you know, some other website or consultant that hasn't consulted us, but we can still use our templates as a checklist. Um, the mentoring approach, uh, taking the time, um, as again was mentioned a few minutes ago, taking the time to talk through the information and help the operators understand what we're looking for and why, um, having, developing some personal relationship with them to where they feel comfortable asking questions. As we all know, that's, that's a hurdle that we all deal with in the field. Uh, so we have to build that comfort level with the operators. Um, we use Microsoft Teams to schedule the reviews of the HACCP plans with the customer once we've finished the review in-house so that we can talk through the issues with them. Um, we can share their screen, they can make tweaks, we can ask them questions. Um, and that has been a huge, huge help. Mm -hmm. If anything good has come out of the pandemic, that's it. Um, it's being able to use Teams in that manner. Um, but again, you know, focusing on not only increasing the efficiency on our end, but also being as respectful as possible of the operator's time by trying to simplify the process where we can. Thanks, John. I, so I'm hearing you're, you've really made improvements on the customer service end of things to be sure that you're um, providing them clear information through your templates, as well as follow up customer service with meetings. Thanks, John. So let's uh, move on to another question here. Um, some of you have mentioned the expertise or where do you find the expertise that you use? You know, those PhD microbiologists. And Jennifer, I know you mentioned um, Dr. Chapman. How did that happen early on? How did you, um, how did you talk Ben into actually being on the committee and making that I, commitment? It wasn't me. I don't know. He was already in too deep when I came on board. He couldn't okay. get out. And I, I, I did. Um, we joked around that my number one priority was to keep Ben happy like that and willing to work, which I don't. It did not take much to keep him happy. He's a happy guy. But I was told when I when I joined the variance committee and when I took the chair position, uh, I was told, look, you know, we in order to keep this moving along, we really need Dr. Chapman and his team, the expert from NC State, and we want to, you know, do what we can to to keep that relationship going. And I really think the important thing from, and I'm just going to speak for Dr. Chapman, I think this is fine to say that he's invested so much in food safety, he wants to be a part of it. So NC State Cooperative Extension for North Carolina, our uh, environmental health programs, we all partner together because we want what is best for, you know, for public health in North Carolina. So Dr. Chapman has been committed and although his, his position at NC State has changed and become more demanding, he now has a team of folks that are very experienced in HACCP plan review and in specialized processes. And so we pull them onto the committee meetings. And it's kind of nice that he's got more people. So it's not all mm -hmm. on him to be that one person having to listen and review plans, but he's always available. And other than him, we really just, we reach out to other people uh, I will, I mentioned Veronica sometimes, well, I was starting to say sometimes she's quicker than me. She's always quicker than me. So I can get Veronica to help me find a contact. I have, again, spoken with Jonathan in South Carolina, Galen, Sean. I've, I just reach out whenever somebody tells me, hey, there's an expert in this and they might can help you. I just reach out to them. And we also have a checklist in North Carolina. I wanted to mention that. Uh, for the local environmental health specialist, and we request that that they try to go by that if they're having to review um, a, a set of a HACCP plan or a request, we we use that, and I'll be glad to share that as well if people will email me. But our expert opinions or expert um, assistance just comes from us reaching out and making those those connections and communication. That's really the only way to do it. None of us can handle all these specialized processes on our own, I don't think. I mean, I certainly cannot, so. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. I think you've made a couple of points here that um, everybody on screen is an expert 
right? Because y'all have lived this for a while and, and you've all had experiences in reviewing these plans. Um, but let, let me mention that NC State is one of the land grant colleges in North Carolina, isn't it? I think so. I think yeah, so, so it's yeah. part of the, the mission of land grant colleges yeah. in each yeah. state to support yeah. um, you know, industry as well as regulatory and as far as the science that's needed. Yeah. Um, well, same question, Sean. Where do y'all find your expertise, those PhD microbiologists, to get expert assistance? So many of them were on the committee prior to me coming aboard at um, the state level. So I had to really rely on previous program directors to reach out to them to um, get, get the expertise, to find out who these people are. And many of them, to be honest with you, Donna, they have retired. So a yeah. lot of our, um, our knowledge base is leaving, they're, they're retiring. And so it's hard to come by these days. So I am, I'm just like Jennifer, I'm having to reach out to other people, other states, our FDA retail specialists. I'm having to call around, email everybody to find out who, who's out there, who knows about these processes. I've had to reach out to John. Um, he's been really good. Our very own John Wheeler here on our panel and just talk to him about certain processes. Um, I, I can't tell you how valuable everybody has been. I mean, Jennifer, Shane, all of these people um, on the call today, even some that are just behind the scenes right now, I've had to talk to so many. And so everybody's been a wealth of knowledge. Everybody has been a great resource to just provide us people. Our sister agencies, Georgia Department of Agriculture, they have um, people that are well-versed in some of these processes that have um, been very good. They've been God sent to allow us um, to just be able to provide people for our committee alone. So that's how I've just been doing it. I mean, I've just been winging it, just trying to find people. <laughs> so um thank thank goodness these people are still around I mean yeah that I can reach out to so that's just basically what I've been doing it I've just been trying to find a way <laughs> okay yeah. well thanks Sean so I, I'm here and you have a network of folks yeah it's, it's key to keep that Rolodex rolling so um yeah <laughs> thank God I have it so yeah it's yeah been I hear you. And that, that's a good point. There are a lot of folks are retiring. So we need to look who are the new experts. That's right. And, um, and, and folks in this room collectively, there are experts within this collective room. That's right. Um, thank you, Sean. And, and Matt, uh, how do you find your, your experts uh, to assist you with these technical questions? Well, really, it's echoing much of what's already been said. Uh, we definitely go to the FDA for research, uh, for um, uh, for guidance and their knowledge. Um, and of course, other state jurisdictions, um, local jurisdictions uh, have been uh, very helpful in, in being able to uh, come up with re uh, information that's necessary to help us guide uh, through whatever we're working through at the time. And of course, universities and, and obviously peer reviewed science. So we try to, much like what, what has already been said, reach out to other people who have already done this before, have some sort of knowledge in it already, so that way we can benefit from that together and kind of expand that, that wealth of knowledge. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's again, that it's, that it's more than one, right? It's more than one contact that we have um, to make this work. And John, I know you've, you've um, shared a reference sheet too that should be on our, our site and available to folks. Um, talk a little bit about the, the experts that you found and that others could contact. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, like everyone else has said, you know, it's a matter of reaching out. Uh, I will say that, uh, you know, the land grant colleges, of course, here in South Carolina, it's Clemson University is our go to. But, um, you know, for example, we were presented uh, with some requests to, to produce cheeses at retail. Well, having, uh, you know, having just finished a cheese processing technology course at the University of Wisconsin, the week before the pandemic shut us down, I met some of the folks up there and, um, you know, developed a couple of contacts uh, through that course, one from the University of Wisconsin, one from the University of Connecticut. Um, uh, Kimberly Baker at Clemson University is a fantastic resource. Uh, I saw that Veronica mentioned uh, Joelle Eifert at Virginia Tech. 
She's another great resource. Of course, Ben Chapman, Don Shafter, we all know those guys and they're wonderful. Um, I'm just touching on a couple of others. Meat curing, Jonathan Campbell at Penn State University and Dana Hansen at NC State. Uh, both are experts uh, in the area of cured meats. Um, uh, Randy Warbo at Cornell University uh, and Keith Schneider at University of Florida. And all of these, like I said, um, you know, it's a matter of you know looking, you know, contacting folks that I know. Say, who who do you know that can talk to me about uh, juice? I've got some questions that I need to ask. Um, uh, with regard to packaging science, uh, Dr. Scott Whiteside at uh, Clemson University uh, is our go-to when it comes to specific um, questions about packaging systems. But again, this document uh, Donna mentioned it is on the uh, uh, files tab on the Pathable. Um, but again, again, it's just reaching out to those we know, and you know, who do you know that can can help with this question? And of course, as Donna mentioned at the beginning, I like to give her at least one hard question a week. <laughs> so. At least, at least, John, <laughs> keep them coming. I like those challenging ones. All right. Well, thanks, John, and and thanks for sharing that reference sheet with everyone. That's valuable. Everyone needs to grab that. And, and keep it close if you're doing a review of HACCP plans and you need that academic uh, expertise to make a call. Um, let me go back to, to Jennifer. And um, how, do you, could you say that the relationship that you have with industry has changed over time? Um, you know, where, did it, where did it start and, and where do you think it is now? So, I can only share my personal opinion and that mm -hmm. when I started on the variance committee, there seemed to be a lot of tension, a lot of um, mistrust, maybe like operators were not trusting that the committee would handle their request in a timely manner, or that maybe the committee wouldn't listen to what they wanted to do. And I know there were issues with communication where things were um, letters or emails not received in a timely manner, that kind of thing. I know uh, I'm a hundred percent sure that's much better just because between the chair and the co-chair, Angie Pinion is my uh, co-chair at this time and she's uh, out right now on medical leave, but I learned from being co-chair with Cindy Callahan when she was the branch head and chairing the committee that you needed help keeping up with everything so we have the NC Variance Committee email address where there are several of us that see things that come in. So we check each other because all of us on this committee have other jobs. Everybody on this committee is either employed as a state or local regulator. They are they have a, a career in industry. They are you know in food science or academia, and they are volunteering to be on this committee. So the amount of emails that come in for us with just questions about special processes and how to handle different, different processes and what's required, whether it's a HACCP plan uh, review or approval only or a variance, these things that come in get lost sometimes in the midst of all the other things that we are looking at, you know, for, for our other job duties. So having assistance within the committee I know personally has helped me because my co-chair will send me an email and say, did we cover, did we respond to this applicant? Have we got that? Have we got a response back? Just that communication to help keep a reminder. It seems so simple and I'm not, like it doesn't embarrass me to tell y'all that with all the work that we have going on in this career, this field, things sometimes get buried and I don't get to something as quickly as I want to. But I know for a fact I've had operators say to me, thank you so much for just answering your phone, for talking to me, for sending me that email back. We do uh, need more information letters. So typically it takes anywhere from three to six reviews. I think John was talking about how many reviews it took for them to get to a, an answer, you know, an approval maybe. Same thing for us in North Carolina. We're still looking at three to six reviews going back and forth with with applicants um, getting more information helping them find what they need and it, it's just back to that team effort of trying to stay on top of it and communicate with the operators but I really think that 
my ability or my allowance of other people to help me has helped our relationship <laughs> with <laughs> industry because I am not trying to control all of it. I'm just trying to keep up with it. And I'm trying to make sure that, that people get their questions answered. I also wanted to say on our website, we have a list, a chart that goes into whether a HACCP plan approval only is needed or a variance is required. And there's even a column called the workaround column. So for operators that see that, they can kind of learn what they can do without a special approval. And we have found that to be very helpful to our operators as well as our uh, local staff to, to help somebody figure out how to do their process safely and whether they need that HACCP plan or a variance and a HACCP plan or can they use a workaround? And that, that has helped us as well. All right, thanks, Jennifer. And to you, Sean. So I, I would echo what Jennifer has just said. Ours started off a little bit rocky as well. Our, our industry partners were probably frustrated with the process because we didn't, I think the, the probably the downfall was is that they didn't have an understanding what the expectation of the process was. And so, like I said before, we created some documents like with the HACCP review checklist, we created that. We needed to educate our environmentalists a little bit more. We needed to have some more open lines of communication between our office and them. So we recognize where we went wrong and we, we just needed to have an, uh, we needed to listen. We needed to listen mm -hmm. to their concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think we did that. And so we have a more positive relationship with our industry partners now because we did listen to their frustrations through that process. Mm -hmm. We can understand that the whole HACCP process is lengthy, it is very lengthy. It's, it can be confusing. It can be frustrating for them. I get it. They have a process that they want to implement and they want to implement it right away. But I think we can eliminate some of that by being open to them and providing a lot more education on the front end about the process and what it really entails. And I think by us doing that and, and providing that education, educating our EHS about the HACCP process, that's first things first, and then creating documents and guidance documents to follow up to that, that is truly helpful to them. So I think our, our process has gotten a lot better. Our relationship has gotten a lot more positive because of that, Donna. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sean. That, that, that's a really good summary um, yeah. for everyone, I believe. And, and we're, we're out of time right now. So I think we're going to have to end there today. But communication is the key. Customer service is the key. But communicating and educating both the folks in the field that are looking at this and are holding hands with folks trying to get um, something move forward. Um, but the, the, in, the first answer isn't no, you can't do that. And I think we've all gotten away from that, um, that no, we can find a way to get to a positive outcome or at least assist to help them to get an outcome that may not be the one that they want, but at least we have a process for reviewing it that is science-based and is very thoughtful and has the right people at the table. Um, so with that, I'm gonna ask our, our panelists, we've got several questions in the chat that we did not get to. Uh, if you wouldn't mind responding to those in the chat, um, I think starting with Amanda, she was looking for tabs um, that y'all have on your website um, to other documents that may be helpful that you found on your websites. And just going down there, including uh, what kind of background would you suggest that reviewers have uh, when they approach doing the review process? What kind of basic uh, training should they have in advanced training? I know there's a lot out there uh, right now. So if you wouldn't mind, please doing, doing that uh, before you leave for today. And I'd like to thank our, our uh, panelists for being part of this really important conversation. This is something that we we've pretty much touched on every year at, at seminar and it continues to be a constant conversation issue. Um, we all can improve in our HACCP plan review process and continue to grow together and really love the idea of networking together to do that. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back to Cameron 
and uh, take us into a shorter break. I think we'll have to do just a 10 minute break, Cameron, and then we'll come back and uh, go to our next speaker. Yes, absolutely. We'll go for a 10 minute break. Be back at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, we only got about half of it.
Shut up, Claire. Please. It is at 100. Welcome back, everyone. It's about 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'd like to get and how did you guys like the brain teasers? Uh, hope you. I see some where uh, some of the cheeses might have been a little confusing, but 
great job on some of those brain <laughs> um, Good job with those. So our next section, our next topic, creating a food safety culture is a topic we started last year. And really we were looking at, you know, since this is such a partnership, uh, bending the curve on foodborne related illness, we wanted to look at how can we um, look at strategies, techniques, lessons learned that industry uh, has been working on to um, actually elevate active managerial control uh, for food safety past that of just having the CFPM. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Rachel Scanlon. And Rachel is an advisor on food safety uh, with uh, Chick-fil-A. She specializes in regulatory compliance, supporting cross-functional innovations, as well as restaurant teams. Uh, prior to joining Chick-fil-A, she was an auditor and trainer with EcoSure and an environmental health specialist in Colorado. Um, Rachel participates in multiple professional support organizations, advisory boards, uh, including NEHA and CFP, and she's passionate about food safety training and enjoys sharing her knowledge with others. Um, so if you guys can join me in welcoming Rachel. Uh, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. I'm going to share my screen. One second. I had this all ready. Hold on. <laughs> Cameron, worst case, you have my slides, right? Yes, uh, I here we go. Ready. Let, I got it. Know. I got it. All right. Too many, I have too many things open. <laughs> Story of my life. Okay. <laughs> All right, can you see it? Yes, looks good. Okay, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. I'm excited to speak to you all about how we've built a cohesive food safety culture at Chick-fil-A. And as Cameron mentioned, I'm on the food safety team. Specifically, I support regulatory compliance. So that means reaching out and connecting with local health departments. Um, and a lot of my role is supporting internal teams. So working with our restaurant designers or our engineers that make new equipment and small wares and just ensuring we are you know, following food code as well as NSF ANSI standards. And I'm there just to answer their questions. Today, I want to walk you through uh, the history of Chick-fil-A. I think it's important to understand the culture of our organization because that really lends itself into how we built our food safety program. I'd like to touch on all, well, the structure we have in place, the different programs we've created, as well as some wins, some challenges uh, that we've uh, faced. And I want to wrap it up with some takeaways for you all. Before I jump in, I do want to say that building a food safety culture is a journey and no cultures are created overnight. It takes a lot of time and effort. And by no means do we think that we have it figured all out. Uh, we are just continuing to strive uh, to be our best and uh, keep our eyes on the ball. Our first, or our founder, Truett Cathy, he opened his first restaurant in 1946. And it actually wasn't a Chick-fil-A. It was called the Dwarf Grill. And it opened in Hapeville, Georgia. So it's um, a town close to the Atlanta airport. And the reason it was called Dwarf Grill was because of its size. So it was just a 10 stool diner. And from there in the restaurant, you know, he cooked, he served his patrons and experimented. And it was there that he 
created and perfected what we now know as the original chicken sandwich. So that was in 1964. A few years later, his sister uh, had a shop at the local mall and said to him, you know, it'd be really nice if we had some dining, uh, some food options here. So Truett opened the first Chick-fil-A in Atlanta's Greenbrier Mall in 1967, and he really pioneered this in-mall dining experience. So fast forward, uh, now in 2022, we have over 2,600 restaurants. We are in 48 states. Uh, this month, we opened our first store in Hawaii. So that was super exciting. Um, we are in Canada. And this year, we opened in Puerto Rico. We have three uh, locations there now. One uh, difference with Chick-fil-A is our franchise model. So all of our restaurants are individually owned and operated. So the owner pays $10,000 up front for the restaurant and then Chick-fil-A bears all those other costs. So Chick-fil-A um, pays for the land, for the building, for the equipment. And the reason the, the cost is low comparatively to other restaurant uh, franchises is because our founder Truett really wanted this opportunity available to as many people as possible. He didn't want it to be a financial burden. Uh, and so he, he said it that way. And, and another difference I wanna call out is how many restaurants our operators can have. So most of our operators have one Chick-fil-A. Some have two and a handful have three locations. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is we really want um, you know, the operator to, to serve their community, but it also helps, you know, then the operator can focus on high quality food, safe food, the customer experience. And it's likely that if you go to your local Chick-fil-A, you'll see the operator there. I mean, he might be in the, he or she may be in the dining room greeting guests or making drinks in the front counter or back of house training team members. So they really are present in the restaurant all the time. Our shared vision at Chick-fil-A is to be the world's most caring company. And Truett always said that he wasn't in the chicken business. He was in the people business and he really placed an emphasis on relationships with his employees and connecting with customers. And that is something that continues on uh, through our organization. And I wanted to share with you all um, just some stories about how I've uh, noticed like how foundational uh, relationships are at Chick-fil-A. So one thing we do, whether it's at the office or at the restaurant, you'll notice we all have uh, name tags. And I, I really like that about it. So you'll be, you know, I'll be taking the elevator at the office or grabbing lunch. And then, you know, you see, so you'll see someone they'll be like, oh, hey, Mark, how's it going? Because you're just looking at their name tag or, um, you might recognize their name and realize you've had a call with them. And then so it just kind of starts that connection. Um, but another story I like to share about uh, my job here at Chick-fil-A was during uh, the interview process. So you have a pretty long and thorough interview process here. And in one of my first, um, like fourth or so interview, um, I was speaking or meeting with my director at the time. And at the end, he asked me if I had any questions. And I said, well, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, what your expectations are for me, you know, at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, like what are those metrics? What, what will I be, you know, will my performance be judged on? And he looked at me and he said, uh, there's, there's none, like, I don't, there's no, you don't have to do any of that. And um, I just, uh, I want you to meet people. And I was like, oh, this guy's gotta be kidding. Like, this can't be serious. Um, 
uh, obviously there's going to be stuff I need to, to do. Um, and, you know, I was used to in past jobs, just having those, you know, metrics and targets you have to meet um, early on and throughout, uh, throughout the job. So I was pretty skeptical of, and uh, when, you know, he was, he was telling me how it was. So I started at chick fil and those first couple months, that was my job. I set up meetings uh, with other people. We call them one-on-ones and 30, 60 minute meetings, just getting to know each other. And initially started with my general food safety team, but then expanded to other groups that I'd be working with. So meeting, you know, with menu, quality, sourcing, all those other um, individuals. And uh, even to this day, you know, I'm not new anymore, but if I'm in a call or on a new project and there's someone in it that I don't know, it's like, oh, hey, let's, let's get coffee, let's get lunch, let's do a one-on-one and share our stories. And I, I realize now looking back how important that was to, to, to my role here um, at Chick-fil-A and just how we do work because now when someone reaches out to me or I have a question or an email um, or I need help on a project, it's, it's so easy to connect to that person, but also like I want to help them. If, if they reach out to me, I'm like, oh yes, I remember so-and-so like, you know, they love hiking or they have this going on. And you just, it, it just really makes work so much easier and pleasant um, because, because I, I like these individuals that I'm working with. So I, I go into detail there because I really um, like that part of, of the organization and encourage all of you uh, to think about that. And maybe that's something um, you could incorporate. So one last thing I want to touch on before we get into the meat of things is that we serve fresh ingredients here at Chick-fil-A, right? It's, those are risky items. Also, we have a lot of increased volume now, especially, you know, we continue to grow throughout the pandemic. We were busy and those, those challenge, that challenges our processes. So that um, spirit of continuous improvement uh, definitely includes a commitment to creating a safety first culture. So it's important as an org that we are all aligned on one principle and that's that we will close a restaurant before we compromise on, on safety. So now I'd like uh, to share with all of you uh, our journey um, and how we started our food safety program. So, Initially, uh, food safety all sat uh, in one department, in supply chain. And it was mainly focused um, on the food coming in at the supplier level. And in 2017, the decision was made that there would be two separate departments. So supplier quality and safety would stay in supply chain. And then there would be a restaurant food safety team and that would split into to field operations, which is our field facing department. And this was one of the most strategic moves uh, and that it really impacted the, our, the forming of a food safety culture at Chick-fil-A because now uh, we were positioned to have influence in the two most important areas, right? Like food coming in to the restaurant and then food going out to our customers. So with that, when this change occurred, there were only a few people on the restaurant food safety team. So it, the team had to be built. And now we have uh, about 30 individuals on our team and uh, continue to, we're continuing to still grow. And while we do have, you know, food microbiologists, food scientists, former health inspectors, we realize uh, that we needed expertise in other disciplines to be a well-rounded well group. So that meant having our own you know, IT uh, individuals so they could help us with advanced analytics uh, to better understand risk. And they create really neat dashboards so that we can integrate our data. We have someone that is solely content and communications. And she's, um, 
really important in making sure we are all sharing the same message and aligned because you can imagine with 30 people, um, I might say one thing and you know Joe might say something else. So it's really important she keeps us all share, you know, sharing the same, the same wording uh, throughout um, all our interactions at um, our office and in the restaurants. And we also have someone whose job title, his team, he's food safety culture, that is his role. Uh, and he works throughout uh, our sports center, our main campus, as well as the restaurants and spreading the food safety message. So I uh, really think he's got a, a neat position. At Chick-fil-A, we were one of the last quick service restaurants to get on the third party auditing train. Um, we, we waited um, and then we started them. However, when we started audits, we didn't have any visibility into what was going on. So auditors would visit their restaurant, you know, complete, complete, a, complete an audit, and then the owner would, would get the report and, and that was it. And um, at the support center, we didn't have insight. We didn't know what was, what were the results. Um, and so after a bit, you know, after we started building like trust with our operators and partnership with a third party team, we decided, okay, like we're gonna now start seeing that data and we're gonna start scoring. So um, what happened with, with those visits, so we call them safe visits. We love acronyms at Chick-fil-A. Um, it's a safety analysis of a food environment, if you were wondering, but our safe visits happen quarterly. And uh, we started scoring them in 2018. And so after every visit, restaurants get a performance level. So they know um, it's scored one through 10 and it takes into account that um, audit, but also um, health department inspection, if they have repeat findings, there's an algorithm uh, for calculating uh, their performance level. So, so we started that. Um, also, we, so we take state visit data, but we also use um, in, internal studies. We, we conduct those. We have other um, external groups that come in and do studies for us. We look at industry trends, we look at surveys, and we take all of that into account when um, determining where to focus our, our efforts and when trying to understand food safety risks. Because obviously we know there are things that are always be a risk um, at a restaurant. Uh, those are known, but we also want to prepare for what's emerging, what's coming, and, and where we you know, need to start solutioning. I want to give you all um, just some examples of, of what I'm speaking about with these safe visits. So we we get quarterly you know data reports, and we realized you know, oh, we're getting a lot of findings on date labeling. Like we are missing this. Um, you know, stores aren't, aren't putting a label or the right label. Um, so we decided as an organization to roll out label printers, two of them to all of our restaurants. Um, we've gotten feedback in the last year about cleaning that, um, I mean, maybe you guys could agree cleaning isn't super fun. Um, but that uh, we need better tools. So we're working with a supplier to customize some cleaning tools for our equipment so that it's an easier process. So we're always taking in that information and, and trying to um, improve uh, food safety and compliance in our restaurants. I do wanna uh, spend some time on this slide because this really highlights a lot of programs we've created in the last few years. Uh, and that we've uh, seen a lot of benefits from. So this first one, we call them CTEs, but I wrote it out for you. So our consultative training experiences. So these are two and a half hour visits provided by our third party auditing company uh, to our restaurants. Uh, they get one a year, they can opt to have more, but uh, they all the restaurants can have uh, one at least. and. What this is, is they schedule it with their food safety advisor and there's no score. 
and um, it's scheduled and the restaurant can decide who they want to have there for the visit. And it is up to the restaurant to guide those two and a half hours. So it's, it's, it's a really good partnership there because the restaurant can say, you know what, we're really struggling with cold holding. I'd like to spend two and a half hours doing a root cause analysis of why this area or this area, I can't get X, Y, Z to town. Or they might say, hey, you know, we've got this emergency response playbook. I wanna go through what we're supposed to do in some of these different scenarios. Or uh, some of these have actually just turned into kind of mock inspections and audits because it is, it's not scored. They wanna know everything, but it's a little, a little easier um, environment. So uh, one thing I do wanna call out about the CTEs or our safe visits is that we really work with our third-party auditing company to encourage consulting and coaching. And they are so good at that where they really partner with our restaurants and offer them, you know, advice and, and ideas. And it's, you know, not, we really don't want it to seem like a gotcha, that it's a really good um, relationship there. So this next program we have is called, we call them Safe Daily Criticals or SDCs, um, but for Safe Daily Criticals, this is our self-assessment platform. So this, um, let me see, I'm gonna see how I can explain this to you all. So on this platform, the restaurant can go in and they pick the day part and about 10 to 15 questions appear. And there are 20 versions of this. So the restaurant can choose to do one a day, four a day, as many as they want, but they won't until their 20th one, then they'll start repeating again is, is what I mean to explain to you all. So, um, so it's, not, it's not the same every time and it's done by zones. So I may open this on Tuesday morning and so it's breakfast and it may send me to just the breading area. And so I'll do some temperature checks. I'll check cleanliness, equipment function um, in one zone. Uh, also, the, it's worth mentioning, there are some questions that do repeat every time and that's our sanitizer concentration and our produce wash, uh, but, but the rest rotate. Uh, so this is um, good, just you know, keep, it, keep, keep it up. You, know, you, never, you never know what you're gonna get when you, when you sign on what your questions are gonna be for that day. We have uh, a new program that rolled out last year called um, our like focus assessments. So what uh, one of our colleagues was able to create was taking those that audit data and from the safe visits, and it takes you know what what findings they had a restaurant may have had, and just pulls questions related to that. So for example. At my restaurant, let's say I had cold holding one or two times in a row, my focused assessment would then just have questions related to cold holding. So we encourage our restaurants, you know, say once or twice a week, do one of these in addition to your safe daily criticals because this is something uh, that you know more time and effort should should be dedicated to. Um, restaurants definitely create their own systems. Uh, they are innovative in, in what they've they've made. I go into restaurants and have seen a variety of laminated papers and dry erase boards, their individual timing systems, just really neat things uh, that that work for them. So it's very you know restaurant specific. We do encourage our restaurants to do these these safe daily criticals. And we encourage them, I have here, build your bench. Like have a lot of people to do it, right? Because if it's just your food safety leader, it's one person, or if maybe it's one person in the morning and one person in the evening, when they're not there, it might not get done or it doesn't you know, really build that food safety culture if it's just one person's responsibility. So get more team members, get more employees involved in those. And 
reward when they find something like make it so it's it's okay if you find something wrong because we want to get better like we don't want this to just take a few minutes and everything's great we know everything's not great so uh if, if an employee finds something they say good job you know thanks for recognizing that and bringing it to my attention um we it, it's important to note for these like our staff like we don't have access to this data this is internal to that restaurant only so no one sees it but them so we really want them to do an honest check on, on how they're doing also they could assign champions like people want to be want to have a responsibility want to be seen and recognized right so maybe it's susie job to be the date label champion and she's checking on those or maybe they do a scavenger hunt and see who can find raw you know incorrect labels and whoever finds the most wins something like that may seem silly or odd but like it's you know getting everyone alerted to like this is something that we pay attention to if you see it tell someone uh, another a program, uh, a resource that we have is called the Best Practices Toolkit. This uh, also launched last year and it's on our intranet uh, for our restaurants. And basically it's top, it's tips from our top performing restaurants and our consultants. And it highlights findings, our, our, our top findings. So for example, we have sections on cold holding and chicken cool down and sanitation. And what restaurants can do is they can choose which um, item they would like to focus on. And it gives them a variety of tools. So for example, if I pick cold holding, it's not just, so we have a separate procedure platform, but this is hey, like here are, you know, five different things that may be going on in your cold rail or in your walk-in. Have you thought about X, Y, Z? It gives them this cool fishbone diagram that has them address like, is it people? Is it equipment? Is it processes? And different ways uh, to get to the bottom of it. So that's been a, a new useful tool for our restaurants trying to get to the bottom of, of why a finding may be occurring. Um, Lastly, we have really grown our consultant team. We have regionalized food safety consultants that go visit and take questions from all of their restaurants. So if it's a, a quick question or, um, you know, it's an emergency situation, say my restaurant, the Nerboil Water Advisory, I call my consultant, they can walk me through a process, what I need to do, or they can fly out and support. Uh, so that's a really awesome uh, tool. Um, and they are a great, a great team on uh, restaurant food safety. Next, I wanna talk to you how we've um, been able to advocate for a food safety culture at Chick-fil-A and what we're doing there. So we realized as a team that we needed to do a better job um, you know, analyzing and quantifying and describing risk in ways that non-food safety professionals could understand and digest. So really like simplifying that message. Also, since COVID, we at, the, at our support center have hired hundreds of individuals. And they, you know, for the beginning, first year or two were at home and weren't able to, you know, train in a restaurant or visit a restaurant um, and really learn that, that part of the business. And, and we are a food business and it's really important that we figure out a way for these new staff and just moving forward, how do we get a food safety message to them? So even if Joe is an accountant, and he's never gonna be working in the kitchen, we still want him to know, you know this, is an appropriate practice. This is not. Um, this is, you know, if you end up going to a restaurant, this is what you, you know, should do. Um, so to give you guys an example, I was meeting with our food safety culture leader uh, last week and talking about, okay, we've got 
a new staff onboarding and it's increasing uh, from one to two weeks. And how can we, we, we literally had the discussion of how do we add more food safety in here? Um, so a couple ideas we talked about were, okay, with the trainers that are already there with the new staff, we can give them some talking points, so that's easy. Um, but could, maybe we can make a fun video, of, like a short two to three minute video that gets played every onboarding session uh, about the importance of food safety and the risk of foodborne illness. Or maybe we have everyone do food handler card training um, or all of the above. And we haven't, we, that was just last week, but um, we are always trying to think of ways to, to infiltrate everyone and just spread the, the, the message that food safety is important. Uh, lastly, celebrating wins, uh, recognizing others. So uh, this, you know, is with staff and at their restaurant level, as I mentioned earlier, like celebrating when, you know, an employee actually finds something when they're doing the checklist and alert the manager. Um, we have a program here called uh, Guardians of the Brand. So when restaurants have elite scores every quarter uh, from those safe visits, they uh, get this award and they're recognized at our annual conference, they're recognized online, um, at their restaurant. So it's a really big deal for us to, um, to praise and, and say, this is amazing. Like you have maintained this awesome food safety score and performance uh, throughout the year. Couple of takeaways I wanna wrap this up with for you guys. Um, first, uh, I was building relationships. So I did spend a little bit talking about those one-on-ones that we do at Chick-fil-A and I really find them impactful and enjoy them. And to see if that's something, whether in your department or at your company, whether it's with new hires or you just want to do it now with people you've been working with forever. Uh, I really just find them so beneficial and fun and another way to connect and uh, yeah, improve uh, more working relationships. As far as partnering with restaurants, I mean, obviously if, if you're an inspector, you, know, you can't be best buddies with a restaurant, like you have to have some boundaries, uh, but just thinking, you know, how, when, when you go in there to do an inspection or an audit of, you know, working, working together with them and, and remembering um, what it feels like um, when someone's coming in to inspect you, right? We've all been followed by our bosses or gone through standardization and it can be awkward and uncomfortable when someone, I mean, I was always like an anxious mess when my boss would follow me around and just take notes and I didn't know what he was writing. Like, is this, am I doing awesome? Am I, am I missing all these violations? Uh, so I, I always try to think of that and be empathetic when I'm you know, visiting our own restaurants as someone from corporate um, that, you know, I'm smiling, I'm, I'm saying hello, I'm using their names, employees' names, um, and just recognizing that, you know, this could be a little awkward. I um, heard a speaker uh, earlier this year and his, my favorite line from his uh, talk was, have you ever thought what it's like to be on the other side of you? And I was like, oh gosh, that is wonderful because I'm sure some people, obviously not everyone's gonna like being on the other side. Um, maybe they're like, that lady talks a lot or she's very loud or I don't know what she just said. But just some like self-awareness and reflection, I really appreciated that. Uh, it was, a, it was a, and I try and recall it um, when, whether you know I'm at work or in meetings or, or at the restaurant. Um, I'm sure maybe you've heard or when you've read or listened to things on food safety culture of like getting that buy-in, right? Like how it, it's not going to work if there's one leader that's into it or one team member that thinks it's important. Um, we here at Chick-fil-A, like we had to have that message, you know, come down from our execs and through staff and then to the restaurant owner, to managers and directors, to the team member. 
Um, so whether you are an inspector or working in industry, like how do you get, like in order to have impact, right? You've got to get more people on board with you because it's it's going to be a struggle if it's just coming, that message is coming from one or two people, right? Employees, like they must be certain that the org values food safety, right? And, and always remembering that actions are way more powerful than words. And lastly, just to say again, like leveraging inspiration, we try that a lot at Chick-fil-A um, and just being positive and doing that recognition um, for, for any project, not just food safety related, um, but always a good, a good reminder uh, to, to celebrate because because yeah that's it's just a, a good way to end the in the day or the week um i actually spoke really fast so um that's most of what i have for you all today um and like yeah just again this this is a journey and i thank you all um for what you do food safety is is my favorite topic and i am glad that you all are out there uh protecting protecting me protecting the public um, and yeah, thank you. How do I? I'm going to stop sharing, Cameron. I'm going to try my best. Uh, I did awesome, it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rachel. A um, couple of questions, and a, a lot of you, you talked about, you know, relationships are key and mm -hmm. making sure you're connecting dots and stories and sharing information. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about what happens to restaurants that, folk, that don't focus on food safety. So, what does a um, you know, well-performing restaurant look like in terms of food safety? Oh, great question. So we um, just last week wrapped up, um, we had like a three month long internal study um, and we were looking at a couple of different items and, and how our basically increased volume is, a, is affecting restaurant processes and, and food safety. But one of, when, when looking at the data, one thing we found was if you had a food safety leader, you did so much better, which seems really obvious, right? But it was just, it was great to just see that like in black and white, like, yes, if someone is there spreading that word and, 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 and you've got systems, you do better. Um, another, or a couple other things our top performing restaurants have is like clear, responsibility and expectations for each role. So you do this, like this is, you know, like I talked about champions or this is what is expected of you as far as, you know, you're just your day-to-day -day, like prep and job responsibilities, but also like from a food safety lens. Definitely ongoing training, communication on a daily basis that it's just top of mind. I had a consultant, I forgot to mention this. Um, I've had a consultant tell me that one of the restaurants he visited, they do those safe daily criticals every day. And on Saturday, they review the top three findings for the week. And then that director will send out a text message like on GroupMe to the team, to all the employees, telling them what it is. And then on Monday, it's like, let's talk about, oh, and, and a good job and a recognition. So it's like, here are our top three issues. Here's something that went really well. And then on Monday, it's like, okay, let's talk about it. How are we gonna fix X, Y, Z? And also way to go, Bob, you know? So just, it's like always there. So then it just, you do it, right? It's not this weird thing that you just practice when an inspector walks in. Um, yeah, let's say all those things. Absolutely, and I'm seeing a lot of, um great takeaways in the in the chat as well. Um, we did have one question come mm -hmm. in. Um, does Chick-fil-A do any routine environmental sampling, especially for raw animal contamination movement in the kitchen? Uh, we do not, not that I'm aware of, um, on our team do any sampling in the kitchen. Um, I think all of that sampling would occur, or as far as for our foods, just at the supplier level and before we're getting it. Um, but no, not um, in the kitchen. What about, do you change your messaging for different learning styles? Um, like maybe you might have older adults working as well as some of the Gen Z. 
Oh, yes, definitely. So um, um, I remember this was a bit ago, Cameron, you might not, like the FDA had like an oral culture report years ago and highlighted um, just like, yes, the benefit of whether it's like videos or posters. I remember this really cool one about like people vomiting and pooping and it was like, don't come to work sick. And I love that because it's very visual. Um, and realizing like that that's really helpful because I knew as an inspector and previously I was a dietitian in my, in my previous life, I loved handouts. I would give out handouts to everyone. I don't think people like handouts. People don't want handouts, <laughs> but I like handouts. But I have to realize like that's not, it's not really what, what most of um, my restaurants want. So um, yes, knowing who I'm talking to and, and being able to vary it. So even like within our, our resources, like our toolkit, we have videos, but um, you know, we, we do have a handout, I guess, if, if you want to do that. Um, we have posters and we have um, these like interactive games for our Gen Zers, you know, cause that might be how they, how they, you know, an easier way to learn. We've talked about, but haven't looked into yet, um, the virtual reality, like what's that look like as a learning style? Um, we just started a food handler card program that's pretty interactive. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's important and always needs to be front of mind because we all learn differently. And just because I like handouts, doesn't, <laughs> most people don't. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, last question, and this is a good one. Um, what is Chick-fil-A food safety team struggling with from a food safety culture perspective? Yeah, so um, so COVID, right? Like everyone, we had some very hard time, but we had some really good public health, I guess, effects in hand washing frequency, I mean, we, team members learned what sanitizing was, what disinfecting was. We were we were on top of it. I mean, health prompts, checking in, not coming to work while sick, and all of that was at top of mind. And I think as we got into 2022, um, you know, we we rolled back at Chick Fil A. We weren't, you know, we weren't requiring you to wash your hands every half an hour, and we weren't disinfecting as frequently. Um, I mean, so we changed our standards throughout the pandemic. And like, as those things went away, the focus went too. And we've had to reevaluate, like, what, what do we do now? Like we had a lot of momentum and we need to get it back. So we were just launching actually this month, like some employee health resources because um, we, we kept the health screening. That was something that was new for us. I know some other restaurants have that in place, but we didn't have that pre-COVID. And so we instituted that before you come to work. Uh, but yeah, really, I, I think it's just trying to get back to those, like the importance of hand washing and not coming to work while sick is, is where our focus is right now. Absolutely, absolutely. And we had one other question come in. Um, do you have any role with uh, supply chain safety? Do I have a role with that? Is that the question? No. Yeah, yeah. so that um, we have an awesome team of like 20 something people that do all the checks for our uh, chicken and produce and all those items. So I, I, I reach out to them, but I do not, I do not have expertise there. Absolutely. Uh, we have another one just came in. What's the strategy for sick people not to come to work? You know, this is key. We see this, you know, across the board. Do they, do they ask, do you have a sick leave or compensations for employees? Yeah. I mean, if I would love to solve that as just a, like a national like issue, right? Like how do we get people not to come to work while they're sick? I think it would be so great from a, from a foodborne illness standpoint. Um, I mean, I think that's what, what we're trying to work on this month. I mean, we've always worked on it, but as we work on this new employee policy and um, getting back out to our, our owners of how important this is. It is because our restaurants are individually owned, it is actually up to those operators to decide if they wanna offer sick days or, you know, like a paid leave or what their, um, what, what that process looks like. Um, I personally, I, yeah, I, I love that idea. So 
so that you don't come to work fall sick, but that would be made at the restaurant level and not from corporate. Absolutely. Well, again, great job, Rachel. And we're seeing that all throughout the chat and really appreciate, uh, appreciate your transparency and telling us about your, how you're creating a food safety culture. And we look forward to continuing this discussion next year with a, another uh, industry um, group. So uh, looking forward to hearing the recommendations for different uh, groups you'd like to hear from. But again, thanks, Rachel, and thanks for breaking that down for us and giving us a good overview of what you guys do so we can look at lessons learned as well as uh, you know the things that are working so well. So. Absolutely, thanks for having me. And I think we have time, we can take about a, uh, a five minute break and return with our final and last presentation um, on um, a EHS net single site study. So we'll return at uh, 1.50 p.m. I'm in a break, right? Let's sing those. Sorry, studio.
So I hope everyone's back with us. Those breaks go so quick, so quick. Um, did want to mention, um, Rachel brought it up in a last session about the uh, FBA uh, oral culture learner materials, and they can still be found online at FBA's website. Uh, they may be called industry outreach materials or FBA oral culture learner materials. And you can actually go probably cl uh, click it in Google or um, go to FDA's retail food safety uh, page and pull those up, print them out and give them to establishments. Or you know, if you're an industry, you can post them in your establishment. Very good material. Um, so our next group, um, they the Tennessee Department of, uh, of Health has, a, uh, has had the privilege of participating in the CDC Environmental Health Specialist Network, which we call EHSNet for over 20 years. In that time, they provided resources to facilitate the design, collect data collection, analysis, and publication of numerous food safety research studies. Um, so our presenter today um, will be Erin Murray. And Erin is an environmental health specialist with the Foodborne and Enteric Diseases Program for the Tennessee Department of Health. Uh, she has over five years of experience in the regulatory side of environmental health. Um, and joined the CDC EHS Net team in 2022. Joining uh, Aaron will be DJ Irving, and DJ's worked as an environmental health specialist for five years with the Nashville Davidson uh, County Metro Public Health Department for five years before transitioning to the foodborne uh, and enteric uh, diseases program at the Tennessee Department of Health in 2016. Uh, from 2016 to 2021, he's worked in the EHSNet program, supporting EHSNet studies, performing outbreak investigations, and conducting outbreak training. Um, and lastly, Danny Ripley. Uh, Danny is an environmental health specialist in the Foodborne and Enteric Diseases program. He has over 25 years combined experience in food safety among private, local government, state government, and federal government sectors. And he's participated in the CDC Environmental Health Specialist Network since 2003 and is currently responsible for facilitating outbreak investigations within Tennessee, conducting outbreak response training throughout Tennessee and the surrounding states. So please join me in welcoming um, DJ, Danny, and lastly, Aaron, who will be our presenter today. Go ahead and share it. Good morning and thanks Cameron for the warm welcome. Hopefully y'all are able to see my screen okay. Um, we're so excited to share with you everything that we've been doing um, just from a Tennessee perspective. So our objectives today are to go over our role within SNET, um, to go over our role within the Tennessee Department of Health and to finish up with just talking about um, some of the studies that we're involved in just in the state of Tennessee. So our single site studies. This is our downtown skyline. We are housed in Nashville, Tennessee, which is home to lots of country music, which you may be familiar with. You may not be as familiar with the fact that we are home to the largest fireworks show in the United States. I actually was not aware of that until I started with SNET and then someone on our team informed us. So there's your um, Nashville fun fact. Um, we have had the privilege of participating in SNET for over 20 years. We held that grant. And SNET sites are comprised of environmentalists who focus on food safety research. So it's a movement from the regulatory side to the research side. And that research is focused on food service establishments. This research has been published and it does have some meaningful value in public health and regulatory communities. Um, here's a map of the participating sites for SNET. You'll see Tennessee there in the middle, New York, Rhode Island, Minnesota are the state sites, and there are some local health departments participating as well, Franklin County, Ohio, Harris County in Texas, New York City, um, as well as New York State, and the Southern Nevada Health District, which um, comprises the Las Vegas area. Um, so that's a very interesting area. Um, here's a close-up of the SNET website. Uh, the main goal, of course, is to pre prevent foodborne illness. Um, 
And research really allows us to get our foot in the door and allows us to say, hey, we're here to have a conversation and just to see how you do things and to record that data and to analyze that data in a truly meaningful way. Um, in addition to being part of our SNET duties overarching with the CDC, we also are a part of the Tennessee Department of Health. And Tennessee is a long state. This probably won't be the first time you'll hear me say that. Um, in this presentation, we're comprised of 96 counties with eight public health regions, which you'll see pointed out in the big areas. The grayed out boxes are our contracted counties and those comprise the metro areas. So we have 13 primary points of contact for environmental health issues and 23 secondary contacts. Our population is hovering around 7 million um, and Nashville itself is experiencing a huge real estate boom right now with that real estate boom. Um, we've actually pushed to over 28,000 food service establishments and over 170 or about 170 environmental health specialists in the field whose job it is to regulate food service establishments along with their other duties. Um, part of what we do is to really just promote NEARS in any area that we can. Um, we also, as SNET, are part of the Foodborne and Enteric Diseases Program, so that's kind of our house within the state of Tennessee. So, as we all know, the public health triangle makes up epidemiology, the lab, and then SNET makes up the, the third leg or the third point of that triangle in acting as an environmental health liaison between epi and lab during times of outbreaks. Um, we also focus on data quality, which I'll go into a little bit more when we talk about our complaint system. Um, we offer trainings and promote those trainings as well as promoting collecting good NEARS data and offering field support to our folks in the field. Um, their job is incredibly difficult. They have a large amount of balls that are rolling, and we just want to be there to offer that support. Um, my personal favorite part of what we do is we're complaint system managers. So you'll see, this is the form that we use. We use the REDCap database and all of our complaints are centralized. So theoretically, every phone call of a person saying, hey, I ate at X restaurant and I became ill nine hours later is in the system. And what we're able to do as complaint system managers is to conduct effective surveillance. Um, and you can see, We've identified three outbreaks, and this comprises the second quarter of the year. So what we do as complaint system managers, we receive an email every time there's a complaint entered into the system. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of take a look at it and see, hey, is this within the realm? Are we seeing things that match up with the complaint that's been entered into the system? And we see 144 people just in a quarterly period of three months we reported ill, we identify hospitalizations, we ask about um, confirmed stool samples, and we collect demographic information as well, like age, and we look at other history. So it's a full history. Did you travel? Um, we ask water questions. So there's a lot of information, and it's just a good house of data. I won't go over every single point just for the sake of time um, on this presentation, but it's it's an incredible amount of data and it's super fun to mine through for all the data junkies out there. Um, there are of course challenges to promoting environmental assessments and promoting NEARS data within the state of Tennessee. One of the biggest ones is um, if we aren't careful, we tend to operate in silos. So central office itself can find that we're in a space where we aren't communicating as well as we should. And our regional and local offices can find themselves in a place where they feel isolated or that they're on an island or they don't have that support. Um, so we want to try to be the liaison between folks in central office who may and folks in the field. Um, and just to offer ourselves as, hey, we can help you in, in any way possible. Um, distance effects. Tennessee is a long state. Um, it's 440 miles long, so for reference, if I wanted to drive from Memphis, Tennessee, which is in the southwest corner of the state, to Bristol, Tennessee, which is in the northeast corner of the state, it would take me about eight hours to do that. Um, 
if I were to get into my car today from Nashville, where I'm sitting, and drive to the center of Chicago, Illinois, it would take me a little less than eight hours to do that. So we have a large area to cover. Um, because of that, our SNET team has a person who is seated in the East Regional Office, um, and that's Danny Ripley. And his goal is kind of, you know, just to, to be able to get to anywhere within the state within the day and to not feel like we're overburdening someone or we're rushing through our environmental assessments or we're missing things. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you wanna look at it, we do have a limited number of outbreaks within the state. So what that means is we've got folks that you'll talk to you, um, field environmentalists who have seen one outbreak in their career and they've been doing this for 20 years, um, or they haven't seen one at all and they've been doing this for 20 years. So that means that there are limited opportunities for hands-on training, which I think we can all agree. Hands-on training is, some of the best training that you'll get. There are different learning styles, but we all love to get our hands dirty, especially when it comes to environmental assessments. Collecting data in the field is tons of fun and doing environmental sampling also is just a ton of fun. Um, so to address those experience effects, we do promote some of the trainings that I spoke about earlier. EATS is the environmental assessment training series and it's found on the CDC website. Um, we also promote the Integrated Food Safety Centers of Excellence training. It's a web-based training and takes a few hours to go through. If you haven't been through either of those, um, we'd be happy to drop some links in the chat for you. We also promote the EpiReady team training. What's interesting about EpiReady, as you might be able to um, glean from the name, is it's not just an environmental health track focused training, even though environmental health is part of it. It focuses on all areas of public health. So. Um, epidemiology, the lab, and the public health nurses, and folks on the clinical side. It takes a look at those roles too. So some of the meat and potatoes of our presentation today, and what we're really excited to show you is what we're doing as our site-specific study. So these are studies that other folks in within SNET, so in other states um, or in the counties that I mentioned, are not participating in. The first one is the raw animal product study. That one is just in the early stages of development. Um, so hopefully we'll have more information to report that shortly in the coming years. The second one is a special process study. We have quite a bit of data on that as that study is sort of coming to a close. And so I'll present some of that today. And finally is the farmer's market study, which is an ongoing study. So I wanna say just a few things about the farmer's market study. Our objective with the farmer's market study was to capture how TCS foods are processed, prepared, served, and sold at farmer's markets across the state. Um, the study began as far as data collection in the summer of 2021, has continued during the summer of 2022, and we expect it to continue in the summer of 2023. Our findings include raw milk, which I'll say a little bit more about later, and foods being prepared on site without a visible permit. This has offered many opportunities for collaboration within TDH, so within other programs within TDH, and also within the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. Um, just to show you the kind of impact that our work has, this is a screenshot from the, an article that was posted in the Nashville scene. It's probably been a couple of weeks ago. Um, and you can see it says inspectors are cracking down on farmers market vendors for sampling and food prep. And so in some of the areas in Tennessee, there's a movement for free markets or open markets. Um, and so you'll see folks just serving things like sambusas, um, empanadas, um, tacos, all kinds of things just in the open air with no hand washing facilities, no bear washing facilities, and um, just wanting to serve that. And, and a lot of times they'll have huge lines of people who are demanding this kind of food. So when you've got high demand and you're making money, you're bound to have some pushback, right? And so here's another article that shows just some of the pushback um, that that folks who are selling their products at farmers markets are saying, hey, we don't like people coming in and telling us we can't do this. Um, so you'll see the two, and I think it'll be interesting to see next summer when we collect data, um, what changes, if any, um, come from, from just, Farmers markets getting public notice. Um, and, you know, 
if you shop at a farmer's market, feel free just to slide in the chat, you know, what your experience is with the farmer's market and what kind of things that you've seen there. We've seen tons of things um, and have taken tons of pictures. Unfortunately, I can't um, put every picture inside a single presentation, but the markup um, of prices at farmer's markets is generally seems to be expensive. Um, you can see it in the upper left corner. Um, that's just a blackboard, and that's generally how people choose to display their prices. If they're displayed at all, some folks, you have to ask, hey, how much does this cost? Um, and that's sort of when you know it's going to be even more expensive. In the middle, you'll see one of my favorite pictures that I took this summer. So the man was making tacos, and the tacos um, had several, of course, TTS ingredients with no time temperature control. His open top drink was beside the flat top grill, no hand washing facilities, taking on and off gloves. Um, and he's got his phone in his hand. So um, all kinds of, if we were to be in a kitchen as a regulator, we would be marking all kinds of violations. Um, in the upper right corner, you'll see that drink. That drink had cut watermelon in it, which we know is a TTS food. Um, they were cutting the watermelon on site, then placing it into the container, then scooping the drink into a cup. In the lower left, you'll see cut lettuce with no time temperature control. It is important to note that some of the markets we visit are for short periods of time. So some of them might last two hours um, and the food might not be out in the hot sun for a long period of time. Um, some of the markets last eight hours. So they're putting product out at eight o'clock and it's still there at four o'clock in the afternoon, you know there may have been some time temperature abuse there. In the middle, you'll see just some processed chicken breast. A lot of times with the chicken, um, we've talked to some folks just as from a customer's perspective and they'll let us know, hey, we're, we're vacuum sealing this in our own kitchen where our, uh, our dog runs through and our kids play as well. And we've even found things like in the lower, right corner sushi and open air market. So it's it's tons of fun, the things that we found um, and may find in the future. So some preliminary findings, we found almost every type of um, raw protein. I think we have seen everything. Um, seafood was our, our smallest category so far, um, but we've seen all of it. Raw milk self observed. Raw milk is legal in the state of Tennessee um, if you sign an agreement with a herd share. And that is the only way it is legal to purchase raw milk in the state of Tennessee um, or to sell it as a part of that per share. Processed ready to eat TCS foods. Um, we found some of those. That would be like your cooked pasta, cooked rice, um, those types of things, dumplings, cheesecakes. Um, lack of permits displayed. I don't know that we've seen a single one. Refrigeration is often limited to coolers and ice, although we have seen both selling products with generators and in a deep freezer or cooler type environment. Some limitations, um, these farmers markets are spread out. There's a ton of them and they have some wonky operation times. So on more than one occasion, we've looked up an operation time online and shown up and we're the only person in the field because the farmers market isn't happening at all. Um, most of them are weekend operation only, which means that we've worked a lot of weekends the past couple of summers. Um, and the study design only allows for customer observation. So we're not going into trailers. We're not going behind tents. We're not even taking a thermometer and sticking foods that are in coolers underneath tents. So it looks very different from any kind of environmental assessment. Um, the second study that I talked about that we'll have some more data to present just because we're we're wrapping that up um, is the specialized process study and the specialized process study is a descriptive study um, with two groups those restaurants that perform special processes and restaurants that don't and so we're looking at how the two differ comparing and contrasting by looking at the knowledge and training that the folks working in those kitchens have had any specific characteristics of the establishment and the prevalence and types of different special processes. Um, we've seen almost every type of special process that you can think of. Uh, most commonly are the ROP in its various forms. You can see we've got some sous vide down there on the bottom right corner. Um, but things like kimchi and uh, fermenting and juicing were also seen in some of these kitchens. Data collection areas, 
were pretty consistent with Davidson County, which comprises the Nashville area, and Knox County, um, which comprises the Knoxville area with some outliers in the surrounding counties. And total locations were 174, with most of those performing, if they performed a special process, it was mostly ROP, um, lots of sous vide, lots of back packaging, some cook chill, fewer acidification, fermentation, and curing, um, almost no smoking, and one instance of juicing. And of the total respondents, you can see, of course, ROP was the most common. Most folks also are only doing one special process in their establishment. There were four instances of folks doing two and two instances of folks performing three special processes on site. Um, so most people are like, mm, one is all we can handle. Um, you'll also see that as you might expect, some most of the places that were doing special processes were family or fine dining, meaning they have a more complex menu. Um, you can order almost anything, whereas a fast food, fast casual, or bistro type restaurant tended to not do a special process within the kitchen, although some did. And some of the things that we did were to compare establishment characteristics, characteristics of employees, and other types of characteristics. Spe establishments that perform at least one special process tend to be more complex. They also tend to be independently owned. So 64% of those that perform a special process were independently owned, as compared to only 36% of those that don't form that don't perform a special process. And average years in business actually tends to be a little less. Um, average years doing the special process was 4.4 years on average. And because these establishments are more complex, they tend to have more staff and to pay those staff higher by wage for performing at least one special process. They also tend to use more locally sourced foods than establishments that are not performing a specialized process. They do tend to have more priority violations on their prior inspection. So establishments that are performing at least one special process have about 1.7 priority violations on their last inspection. And establishments that do not perform a special process only have about 0.7 violations. Um, and that was a statistically significant difference. Some other things that you'll notice, um, the customer volume is a lot, is, is heavier in establishments performing at least one special process. They also tend to spend more money as the menu is more complex and items tend to cost more. Some other things that we can see is for non-management establishments that perform at least one special process only have 62% turnover, whereas those that do not have 96% turnover. The employee turnover as far as management goes was a little bit closer together. And in fact, for special processes, um, management tended to turn over about 22.5% versus non-special process at 20.3%. Average time in industry for Management that performs more special processes or one, one special process. Folks are there for about 20 years, whereas um, 17 years would be for non-special processes. And average time employed at the specific restaurant was longer for establishments not performing a special process. It was nine years as compared to establishments performing a special process being six years. Management does tend to work more hours per week on average in establishments that perform a special process and food safety characteristics. This is where I kind of like to focus and camp out for the remainder of our time. 78% um, of managers report that they've taken a class or a course in HACCP at an establishment that performs a specialized process. So that leaves 22% that report that they haven't taken a class or a course in HACCP. And as we've discussed um, when we had the panel HACCP discussion earlier today, HACCP is a pretty formal process, right? So we want our folks to have training. And in fact, training is a requirement for HACCP. Um, so we're definitely seeing some opportunities. And those priority violations that were seen on the last inspection, those indicate, hey, there may be a need for increased food safety culture. And HACCP, if, if not performed properly, these special processes can contribute to foodborne illness, which from an outbreak standpoint is really what we're concerned about. Um, 
79% of managers reported on the job training in their specialized process. For non-management staff who are responsible for specialized process, that number decreased to 50%. It's only about half of those who say that this is my job to be at the cook chill station, or this is my job to be at the curing station, or this is my job to be at whatever your special process is. They're only about half of those folks have had training. So there is a significant need for that training. We also ask folks, hey, why do you even want to do a special process? What is your reasoning behind that? And of all of these options, they could choose more than one. So that's why you'll see some variation in your percentages. But all of the folks surveyed said they, they do their specialized process to enhance quality. They also do that to increase efficiency and reduce waste. And those two can tend to go hand in hand. Extending shelf life also can tend to go hand in hand with reducing waste and increasing efficiency. Fewer folks say that they're doing it to reduce costs for public demand, and only 7% or two of the surveys said that they um, are doing their special process for food safety purposes. So some major takeaways is that for an establishment that's doing a special process, you're probably gonna be looking at a larger, more complex establishment with a more complex menu and more staff involved. Uh, and there are significant training opportunities. 22% um, reported that they had very limited passive training and that's management. So we definitely want those folks to have it, but we want anyone who's doing a special process in the kitchen to be able to confidently say, hey, I have training, let me walk, let me show you my training opportunities, let me walk you through how I do my special process. And so with that, um, I'd like to just thank our partners at TDC SNET. We really enjoy working with them. Um, Katie Garman, who is the director of the Foodborne and Enteric Diseases Program, um, Dr. Dunn, who's our state epidemiologist, and Siobhan Dodds, who's the epidemiologist with the Centers of Excellence. And, you know, we've talked a lot today about folks having a calling for food safety culture. Um, if there are people that have a calling for food safety culture, um, you know, Danny, DJ, and the other folks that I mentioned on my team definitely have that calling um, for food safety culture and for promoting that and preventing foodborne illness. So with that, I'll take any questions and I am going to try to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Erin. Uh, any questions, please place them in the chat and we can get them to Erin and uh, DJ and Danny. Um, start us off with one question. Um, Erin, why was the farmer's market data collected from a customer's point of view? So the main reason that we did that um, is we were able to skip some steps in our IRB. So, but that also with not having human subjects opened us up to looking at things from a customer's point of view, people, we found that people are very forthcoming. You know, if I show up and I'm collecting data on my phone and there have been times on Saturdays or Sundays, which I may be giving myself away here, but I've gone out to these farmer's markets in my running clothes or, um, you know, workout clothes and I just look like a regular customer. And so people aren't intimidated by that. So you show up and you just talk to them, you know, like, hey, I'm someone who's out here enjoying my Saturday. And I will say, you know, we, we've also spent money at these farmer's markets, you know, there's been times that, that we've seen products and whether it's because we want to get labeling information or whether it's just something that we're interested in eating at home, um, we, we purchase things. So it has been fun. Awesome. Uh, we've got another question. Are you looking to require licenses and or routine inspections for farmer's market food vendors. So the idea with these farmer's market vendors is that if you're, if you're setting up and you're selling food, that food should be prepared in a permitted kitchen. And a farmer's market is not a temporary event. Um, there are some things that could look like temporary events, right? But we're not issuing temporary permits for, for these folks. So. Ultimately, if they're going to sell their TCS food, then they need to have that food packaged and held properly and not be prepping it on site. So we were um, shocked, I think is a good word, for the amount of TCS foods that we found prepared on site. 
Cameron. Cameron. Um, Hi, this is this is Debbie Pickle with the Department of Health for Tennessee. Um, if a food is being prepared and served to the public or offered to be served to the public that is out of the original package at that time they would be required to meet the requirements of a food service establishment and be permitted on site um, some of the issues that we have are are actually seeing is some of the markets um it, it makes it difficult whenever they pop up and we don't know about those and we are starting to um, make those individuals have permits um, and as you know we've talked about this before uh, Tennessee has um, enacted the Tennessee Food Freedom Act which allows non-TCS foods to be sold and um, prepared in homes without any source of inspection or uh, permitting. They can sell these uh, at retail food stores as an agent um, and in restaurants as long as those foods are stored separately from the, uh, the restaurant sto food storage areas. They have to be up toward the front of the um, restaurant so but for farmers markets we are starting to get those permitted um it just takes some time to get everyone under uh get all the requirements under control absolutely Thank cameron you for sharing that cameron i would add that you know one of our goals when we started this um study was just to understand what was going on out there because it was kind of this unknown area an area that uh, you know, regulators really don't go into unless they're just happen to go on a weekend to a farmer's market. So uh, that was the goal. The initial goal was just to understand what all is going out there. And, and that goal was really driven by the raw milk. We had some raw milk outbreaks. So um, as Aaron said, when we got out there and started seeing all these things, um, uh, it, was, it was very interesting and enlightening. And the end result of this um, you know, ultimately, there may uh, be more presence of EH in these environments, but uh, are certainly we just want to show what's going on out there to our um, to our public health community here. Absolutely. Thank you. And this is the last question. Um, are you aware of any foodborne illness outbreaks related to farmers markets in this state? I'm not, but I'm going to defer to Danny on that. Um, I, I read something recently that was asking that similar question. So, Danny, do you have anything on that? No, in, in, in my experience, uh, and, and that's just limited to Tennessee, um, I have not, I have not investigated or worked or been involved in any outbreaks associated with farmers markets. Awesome, awesome. So we'd like to definitely thank you all for all of the great data and results you've all provided uh, today for us, as well as the numerous amount of years that you guys have been working with EHS Net and providing that information for the public health community. Um, with that being said, all questions are, I think in the chat we've answered, um, there is a um, FDA course on um, temporary food service establishments. Uh, I think it's FD 204. Um, there was a question about TFE guidance documents, and Donna provided uh, some guidance that they could look to in the chat, and there's also an FDA course available as well. I think those will be online still for the next year. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to Donna for last words. Donna, I think you may be muted. Sorry. <laughs> so we're at the end of our breakout session. Um, Cameron, you're on. Dan, if you're available, would you mind coming on camera? I just wanted us to end in a familiar place. Um, if we were at a face-to-face -face meeting, we're usually the last ones in the front of the room. <laughs> so this is the Southeast team. 
and um, for all of us from myself and Cameron and Dan, uh, we want to thank you for being here again this year and look forward to next year when the meeting will be somewhere in, in person. Uh, we would like to definitely thank our, all of our presenters and our, and our speakers today to, for them sharing their expertise and their experiences um, and really providing good fodder for our very robust discussions that we've had during this session. Um, there will be a recording, I think Chelsea just put in the chat, there will be a recording of the session available in about 10 hours. Uh, and the documents that, that have been shared will also be available. So, you know, this is available after the fact. So make sure you, you make use of those. And to all of you, we thank you for continuing to do your food, food safety job wherever you are, if you're, if you're in industry or academia or in the regulatory um, realm of things. Thanks for doing your job yeah, wherever you are in the continuum. Um, because we are public health and we're out there doing our best every day. And, and it's, been, it's been hard recently, but I think we got a reminder today that, yeah, we, we have some swagger that we should be proud of. And we need, need to be sure we put our capes on uh, every day when we go out and sell uh, food safety and sell public health, as we've always done. But it's, it's always good to have that reminder and a good shot in the arm for everybody today. So be on the lookout for news for next year's um, seminar, and it will be face-to-face, -face, and y'all take care. Bye.